Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen sister demands I pay off her BMW. About a year ago, my sister, G, who's 23, bought a BMW she couldn't afford. She also had a bad habit of getting expensive items for TikTok and Instagram posts. I lucked out on hitting the jackpot with my wife and job. My wife typically makes a lot more money than I do, but she's currently on bed rest with a difficult pregnancy. It has been almost two months. It will last the rest of the pregnancy. She has inherited a plastic anemia. While we have some savings, we live within our means with two paid off cars and a nice two bedroom house. My dad, who speaks English as a second language, calls me upset that someone is trying to steal my sister's car. It was being repossessed for non-payment. I called my sister and asked what was going on. She first said she was one month behind, then admitted she was three months behind. She said she would have the money next week. She never called the car dealership to follow up, and the car was sold, sticking my sister with the remaining balance. Now she doesn't have a car and is driving my dad's older Jeep. I have offered my car for her to use, but it's a Toyota, and she rejected it. She's been harassing both of my parents because she says I could have lent her the money, and my wife is lazy about her pregnancy. Now I'm getting unwanted advice about getting my wife back to work since she has worked from home previously. My wife is sick. I'm already worried about her health. She's losing weight around the six months and isn't eating well. My sister has told me our mom had seven kids and my wife is milking the pregnancy for attention. At this point, I cut my sister off and stopped going to my parents' house where she lives. A few family members think I'm the jerk for not helping my sister financially with a car that she couldn't afford in the first place. Not the jerk. Your sister sounds like an entitled brat. You do not owe her anything. Her lack of concern for your wife and her unborn niece or nephew is incorrigible. She is an adult now and needs to start acting like one. Not the jerk. You're a good person for sticking by your wife and your sister is an entitled child who is in for a rude awakening. When adults buy things they cannot afford subsequent payments on, this is what happens. The family members who are behind her are enabling this entitlement. You're the jerk. I had a cousin who won the lottery many years ago and refused to help anyone in the family, even in 2009 when my family had our home foreclosed on. Again, lottery winner cousin didn't lift a finger to help. What your sister asked for was next to nothing and you couldn't even be bothered with it? I hope you feel good about yourself and how privileged you are. Well, what do you think? Should OP have given money to his sister or not? Please let us know. Too bad, so sad. Should have bought a DeLorean instead, baby mama. Heck hath no fury like me scorned. This story starts 31 years ago, but the revenge part was pure serendipity that began two years ago. I'm going to shorten most parts because it's a crazy ride, but I'll be happy to answer any questions y'all have. I learned a ton on this journey, and part of the reason for this write-up is to share that with others. The Beginning in 1990, when I was just out of middle school and my sister was still in elementary, my dad met his third wife at the only gas station in our town. They soon moved in together and he abandoned us in our old basement apartment to live in a shanty houseboat that didn't run to live with her. He would show up every other week and give me $40 for groceries. Eventually, someone figured out the situation and called my mom. We went to live with her, which was, believe it or not, worse. My dad and his shanty wife got married in 1991. Not long after, she called me and told me that my dad's brain tumor had returned. It hadn't, and that he couldn't handle the stress of being around us, that the only people he could bear to be around were her and her son, Shorty, who was my age. When I called my dad to ask if this was true, he said it wasn't, and he just couldn't believe that she would say that to begin with. That was one of our last conversations until two years ago. The Middle there's not much in this part. I worked my way through college, living in my car from time to time. My dad and I were no contact, but I heard from family that he had bought a house and put his son through some vocational classes. When my grandmother passed, 
Shorty and Shanty Wife showed up in a truck and took all the furniture and anything else that wasn't tied down or already gone. Eventually, I went no contact with my dad's side of the family. I struggled for years, decades really, but I made it, and I have a great job and a good family now. The best revenge is living well, right? The Pre-End Warm-Up Two years ago, October of 2019, I got a call from my dad's brother, Alan. He told me my dad was in a nursing home in another state. Great, and I needed to go see him because he needed my help. What the heck? Shorty had ghosted him. The nursing home, coincidentally, was about 20 minutes from my house, and I saw an opportunity and I went. The reunion was underwhelming. I didn't want to make amends, but I did want to hear how he wound up dumped and all alone in another state. And it was a really, really good story. Shanty wife had got lung cancer and put my dad in a nursing home before she passed in 2017. Shorty became his power of attorney when she passed and had been visiting my dad, living in my dad's house with his two kids and taking care of my dad's affairs since his mom passed. But now he was MIA and my dad was worried about him. He asked me to drive the hour and a half to his house to check on everything. That's all he wanted. He never even asked me how I had been. I agreed to go, I think out of morbid curiosity. I'd never even been to my dad's house. I did want to see where he lived with his real family for 30 years. I wanted to see what could have been my life. It was 50 shades of awful. The grass hadn't been cut all summer. You couldn't get to the front door from the overgrowth. There were three pickup trucks in the yard Two were full of trash. Cabs and beds and back seats, just trash. Mail, clothes, paper, shoes, garbage bags. I couldn't understand it. My dad's handicap modified SUV was on four flats and full of garbage too. I didn't have a key, so I just walked around. From what windows I could look through, the inside was in shambles and hoarded to heck. On the front and carport doors were dozens of notices from the city that they were going to condemn the place. The carport was also hoarded, boxes and boxes stacked on each other, most rotting from the rain. The yard was full of garbage, broken Christmas ornaments, more shoes, rusted tools, old toys. There was a letter in the mailbox notifying him that since the house was abandoned, mail would not be delivered anymore. That night, I googled powers of attorney and how to use them. I went back the next day and showed my bedbound dad the pictures on my phone. He vowed to beat Shorty up, then asked me to help more. I told him I would, but he'd have to sign power of attorney over to me. All of it, durable, financial, and medical. If he didn't, he could figure this stuff out by himself. He agreed, so I set about finding a lawyer who would drive to another state and do the paperwork in the nursing home. Bless that lawyer for being so good at his job, because all I did was tell him what I knew and he put together a beautifully bulletproof POA. It was full of stuff I didn't even know I would need. He also filed the paperwork to revoke Shorty's POA. And now I'm unstoppable. We're from a small rural town and it's the kind of creepy landlocked place that no matter how long you've been gone or how far away you've been, when you go back, you'll see someone you know. Even if you don't know, you know them. It's like playing seven degrees of everybody all the time. It's suffocating, but it can also be helpful the beginning of the end. I got to work the next morning. I didn't know how scorched the earth would be when I finished and I didn't want Shorty or anyone from his prolific inbred family trying to find me, so I made sure nothing I did had my name on it. I opened a Google account for my dad and got a Google number. I opened a P.O. box for him in his town. I put in a mail forwarding notice. I pulled his credit report. I took the POA to my dad's small town bank changed the address on his accounts, and got new account numbers. I requested copies of every transaction back to the day Shanty Wife had passed, about 13 months worth. I had to go to the main branch two hours from my house the next day to pick the records up. I sat in the lobby all afternoon going through the account. I cornered a service rep and got a crash course in his debits and deposits. This is when I figured out the extent of Shorty's staggering stupidity. My dad got about $5,000 a month in disability and social security every month. Twice a week, Shorty was going into a branch and withdrawing cash, all of the cash, for 13 months. And every time he did it, as the POA, he had to sign a form stating that he was acting on behalf of my dad, and that form was notarized by the bank. I went through every withdrawal, 
and got the bank to confirm that every one of them was made by Shorty. Then I went to the house and called a locksmith. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea what was waiting for me there. He got the first door open and the stench rolled out like a fog bank. We both gagged. Two locks later, I was so embarrassed by what he had to see and smell, I gave him a $60 tip. And with shiny new keys in hand, I called the cops. I told them I was POA for my dad, was checking on his house, and there were three vehicles there that didn't belong to him. He asked me if I knew who they belonged to. I said no, and I wanted them towed. He told me to call a tow company, and he would meet them there. They showed up with two wreckers. The tow truck guy got out and asked me for a signature. I only signed my first name. As I was signing, he asked, Do you know Shorty? Running on pure hatred at this point, I surprised myself. Do you? I asked. He said he did, and that he's a jerk. I responded, he might be. Hey, can you do me a favor? If you see him, will you tell him MNWNM is coming for him? His bravado evaporated. He knows a crazy when he sees one. They towed the trucks. When everyone was gone, I opened the door in the carport to peek in. The sun was going down and it was dark in the house. I heard something faint and after some seconds realized it was the roaches and the rats doing their roach and rat stuff. I could smell it all in my hair. I sat on the carport steps and watched the sun go down. I was mad, just so cosmically livid that 72 hours was all it took to dissolve three decades and here I was, stinking and listening to the rats and cleaning everyone else's crap up, taking time away from my family. And for what? I had it coming to Jesus with myself. I could either bow out now or double down. And the thing is, I'm tenacious to a fault. I had to be to survive, and this was a bone I couldn't put down. The thought of Shorty's life being upended, his only source of income, probably, disappearing literally overnight, and my dad having to hear secondhand from me that he's broken alone made me absolutely giddy. I desperately wanted them both to lose what they had left, so I decided I was going to triple dog down. That night, I googled restraining orders, and it was surprisingly easy to get one. I went to the courthouse in my hometown, went to the clerk's office, and told her I needed a restraining order. I filled the form in at a rickety little table while I was there. I wasn't prepared to see a judge that day, but she took the form and said, okay, I'll see if the judge is still here. That kind of scared me. She took me to his chambers, and as I was waiting, I looked around and saw he had certificates of appreciation hanging up from various veterans groups. Then I wiped my palms and thought, fish in a barrel. He asked about my dad's stint in the Marines and about the DOD office logo on my sweater. I'm a contractor. He read my form and granted the temporary order. I would have to go back for the permanent one where Shorty would be able to argue against it. Then I went home and googled biohazard companies and elder treatment statutes in my state. I hired a biohazard company to shovel all the crap out of the house for $7,000. I would have paid double. They found my dad's mummified dog under some pizza boxes in the master bedroom. They sent me pictures and salvaged some papers. Shorty was served during this time and a hearing was set. I got to work collecting and documenting crap. I made pictures and spreadsheets and timelines with cross-references because now they had my full attention. The paid versions of Truthfinder and Trello seriously got me through all this. In my spare time, I went to the nursing home and gave my dad 8x10 copies of the pictures of his dead dog from every angle. Before court, I went to the police station nearby and told them that I wanted to report an elder mistreatment crime. A white-collar detective came out and told me it was a domestic matter and that since Shorty had been POA, everything he had done was legal. And this was the day I got to teach a small-town detective about the fiduciary responsibilities of a POA. Thanks, Google. I handed him a copy of the statute with the applicable sections highlighted. Then I handed him a thick folder with bank statements, pictures of the hoarded house and the dead dog, a copy of my dad's credit report that showed he was tens and tens of thousands of dollars in debt, and a spreadsheet listing every cash withdrawal with a running total of the stolen amounts. The grand total was just over $130 in cash. That's not including the lost value of the house or the credit cards he opened and used. I told him he could keep that folder since it wasn't the only one I had. Then I told him I would wait for a case number and I sat down. He came back about 30 minutes later and apologized, said I had a case and gave me a case number. Then I headed over to the courthouse. 
this is the end. There were other people there and I had to wait my turn. And while I was waiting, that stupid jerk walked his sloppy self into the courtroom by himself and obviously, literally, non-metaphorically, dirty. His shoes were untied and that turned my giggle box over. Then it was our turn and we stood up. The same judge asked me some questions, asked him some questions, and asked me if I had any proof. I had a very thick folder of it. The judge asked me if I had gone to the police. Well, yes sir, I have. Do you have a case number? As a matter of fact, the order was granted, permanently and for life, but not before the judge halted proceedings and told Shorty he needed a lawyer. Someone told me that the courthouse would have a copy of my dad's DD-214, discharge papers, so while I was there I got a copy of those, because why not? I also used my POA to take Shanty Wife off the deed to the house. That way, if my dad passed and it went into probate, Shorty had no immediate claim. I also went and got copies of my dad's birth certificate and Shanty's wife's death certificate. Technically, stepkids can't request that kind of info, but the clerk who waited on me recognized my dad's name and told me she had hooked up with my uncle Alan in the 60s and went to my grandparents' funeral, so I got all the forms I wanted. Shanty wife left my dad $50,000 in life insurance. About $35,000 of that was left since Shorty was spending my dad's money and not his mom's. So I opened an Ally account and transferred every penny over. Then I set up recurring transfers for the monthly deposits. At any given time, there was no more than $100 in his account. I also found a house flipper that paid me enough for the house to pay off his mortgage. That's the thing about probate. There's nothing to fight over if there's nothing there. And I made sure there was nothing there. My dad passed, thinking he still owned a house. Speaking of which, this is about the time I found my dad's life insurance policies. They were up to date and Shanty Wife was the beneficiary. My POA didn't allow me to change beneficiaries, but it allowed me to assign them. And since Shanty Wife was gone, there was technically no beneficiary. This is where the death certificates came in handy. I assigned my sister and me as beneficiaries. Irrevocable too, which means that the only way to change that is for my dad and me and my sister to agree to it. I kept my dad in the dark about all this. The only thing he ever really knew about was the restraining order and his dog. I found out that he had purchased the gravesite next to Shanty Wife and wanted to be buried next to her. That was just never going to happen. I googled national cemeteries and found out he qualified to be in one since he was a disabled Vietnam era veteran. So I arranged for that instead. All the cherries on top. My dad passed in June this year and I was there. He's buried in a national cemetery far away where no one will ever go visit him. The only obituary I ran was on the funeral home's website, and that only for insurance purposes. I wrote it as vague as possible. There was no service. His urn is purple, the color he hated most. I got a call in August from the prosecutor's office in my hometown. The lady on the other end is married to my first cousin because of course she is. That's how it works there. Shorty was arrested just after midnight on July 1st, was still in jail and had been arraigned on felony elder mistreatment charges. He's facing 10 years in FPMITA prison now. She told me not to expect the trial anytime soon as it can take up to three years for that to happen. I told her that was awesome since the uncertainty will hopefully haunt him and after all that he's still got prison to look forward to. He lost his kids. He lost his dad. I'm spending his mom's money. He lost his free house and trucks. He has no credit and will never be able to get any sort of decent job and will, hopefully for a long time, not be able to find a decent place to live. And I sleep like a baby. You can't get quarters from bug bites. When I was in the army, my unit had a training day one day where we did tactical movements and close quarter combat with paintball guns. It was pretty fun, except it was in Texas in the middle of summer in a training area full of tall grass that I ended up crawling around in a lot. I didn't notice any problems until a couple hours later when I was getting ready to head home and my legs started burning. I pulled my boots off and rolled my pants up and my feet and legs up to mid-thigh were swollen and covered in hundreds of angry red welts. Apparently, I'd crawled through a nest of chiggers, tiny biting bugs common in America that are apparently called Trombiclidae officially, and they had gone to town on my legs bad enough to provoke an allergic reaction. I drive myself to the emergency room at the base hospital 
And while I'm waiting to be seen and feeling more and more terrible, but needing to focus on something else, I started counting the bites. I stopped when I got to 100, and that was just on the inside of my right calf. The doctor had never seen anything like it, and I ended up getting a massive dose of antibiotics and inflammatories, all hospital grade and with serious side effects of their own, as well as four days of quarters, the military equivalent of being told to stay home and don't come into work. My girlfriend came and picked me up from the hospital and drove me home because at that point I was in no state to drive myself between the allergic reaction and the meds I was on to treat it. On the way home, I called my sergeant to let him know about my situation so he can get word up the chain of command. About an hour after that, I get a call from the first sergeant, the senior most NCO in the unit, herself. Now, she was one of the most incompetent first sergeants I ever worked with during my time in the army, constantly making terrible decisions, mindlessly greenlighting whatever terrible decision our equally incompetent captain came up with, and micromanaging people unnecessarily. She tells me that my quarters have been revoked by the captain and that I have to come in the following day. I tell her that I'm holding orders in my hand from a doctor who's also a lieutenant colonel that I'm supposed to take time off to recover. She responds with, you can't get quarters from bug bites and rants at me that I'm just malingering and trying to get out of work. There was no way I could possibly seriously be ill from just some bug bites. I tried to explain that I had had an allergic reaction, but she wasn't having it, insisting I was a liar and a bad soldier because of it. I was to be at formation the next morning at 09 because of the extensive exercise we all got at the training event they had cancelled PT for the day, with my supposed quarter slip, and they would decide then if they were going to punish me more for trying to pull this stunt. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, I wore my PT uniform, a t-shirt and shorts rather than our fatigues the next day and had my girlfriend drive me in. I was still too messed up from the bites and meds to drive. I figured if I was going to get in trouble anyways, being in the wrong uniform would be the least of my worries. But my bare legs inside showed off the literal hundreds of now angrily red, almost purple or black in some cases, huge welts on my legs. The skin was more welt than not by the next morning and I walked up showing off that rather horrific sight to my entire company of more than a hundred enlisted NCOs and officers. Literally, everyone who sees me is like, goodness, Quester, what the heck happened to your legs? It's clear to every single person in the company that I am actually legitimately having an allergic reaction just by sight alone. The first sergeant hears people making a ruckus, sees me, and turns bright red knowing she messed up when she hears me answering warrant officers, including my direct supervisor, asking, why are you here if you're that sick? With, first sergeant made me come in and told me that you can't get quarters because of bug bites. Within 10 minutes, I've handed in a copy of my quarter slip, gotten a quiet and very private apology from the first sergeant and was sent home for the next four days. Would I be the jerk for taking everything in my dad's will? I, 38, have been no contact with my dad and two younger siblings for many years. My dad always treated me like crap because he was convinced that my mom cheated on him. Because she did, a lot, and trapped him into a crappy marriage and that I was not biologically his. For my 13th birthday, my dad bought me a paternity test and even though the test results came back that I am indeed his, he accused me, or my mother, of hooking up with the test guy. I have also done an ancestry DNA test and also matched with all his relatives, so I'm pretty sure that unfortunately, he is my biological dad. I've known for a long time that my younger sister was not my dad's. When I did my ancestry DNA test, my sister wanted to get one done too. My mom freaked out, admitted her indiscretion, and begged me to convince my sister that it was a waste of money and that she could just have a copy of my results. I did because I thought I was protecting her and she was going through a rough time at the time. I recently got a notification about an Ancestry DNA match. I looked it up and it looks like my brother's ex-wife got one of the kits for both of my brother's kids. And lo and behold, my brother's kids only seem to share relatives from my mom's side. FYI, my profile uses a screen name so she would not have recognized who I was. My brother and sister have been really crappy to me for years. Comments about how I owed their dad for him putting a roof over my head as a child and how dare I accept items from their grandmother's estate, etc. 
I put up with it for years because they are younger and honestly not that bright. I thought they'd come around eventually. My dad made sure in a drunken fight with my mother to give me a copy of his will, still have it, so that I knew that he had put a stipulation in there about his estate being divided amongst his biological kids. I know that he has not changed his will since because his mental capacity has changed, TMI. Would I be the jerk if I did not tell my siblings and just let this play out at the will reading? Take everything and kick them out of the family home? I would also be setting up funds for my nephew since my loser brother doesn't pay child support. My husband thinks that this is stooping to their level as they both rely on his estate currently for survival, so this will ruin them. They have no education or way to support themselves currently. But I kind of want to stoop. Reply, check with a lawyer. Due to the stipulation in your will, you will need to demand a DNA test. Would recommend you not stir the pot for now. All it will do is put your siblings on the defensive and they will probably start some expensive shenanigans. Wait to let the drama unfold at the will reading. Make sure the will is kept somewhere safe. If they know they will not inherit it, they will try to destroy that will. Not the jerk, but I think you will be unpleasantly surprised if you expect to wave around an ancestry test at a will reading and magically the estate goes to you. If there's real money involved, including value of the house, I think you consult a lawyer now while he's still alive. I'm sorry you have a crappy dad and siblings. Christian Holier Than Thou entitled Mom is Back. This time, I'm not so nice. To give some background, every Christmas, me and my wife do our own version of Secret Santa where we find some family in our church or surrounding community that is very financially strained and might not be able to afford Christmas gifts that year and buy gifts for everyone in that family. This has been the fourth year we've done this and quite frankly, it's a very rewarding experience to deliver holiday joy to a family in need. We mainly find our families secretly by asking church friends if they might know of a family that is going through a very tough time financially. Most of the time, the family either knows a secret Santa is helping that year or has completely blindsided Christmas morning with special delivery. Although due to lockdown, we plan to load the presents on the doorstep and ring the doorbell as we get the family's reaction from the sidewalk. Now onto the story. We got our information for two separate families that needed help this year and me and my wife were planning out which gifts to buy for both families, gift budget, etc. During our brainstorming session, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. When I picked up, it was a kid's voice informing me that my mother would like to talk to you. I could hear the kid hand the phone to someone else and then I was greeted by a familiar voice, the entitled mom of the story, aka friend's aunt, entitled mom. Hello, OP. Me, eyes growing wide and silently cursing under my breath. Entitled mom? To what do I owe the pleasure? Entitled mom. Well, I'm glad you asked. My nephew mentioned during a family Zoom call earlier that you were buying Christmas gifts for random strangers this year and how commendable your charitable giving was. Me, mildly flattered at my friend's words, but at the same time wishing that he just kept his mouth shut. Well, he is correct. I am doing a secret Santa this year. Perfect. That's why I wanted to call you. Me, you know of a family in need? Yeah, me. One thing I should point out about Entitled Mom that I learned from my friend is that she used to be married to a rich guy whose family owned some oil fields. From what I understand, when they divorced, she didn't get ownership of the family's assets. Despite this, she still stuck the guy with alimony and gained 70% custody of their child. Back to the story. Me. You need help? Entitled Mom. Yes. You see, I really wanted to get my son a PS5 for Christmas. And since my gift budget is already strained this year, I'd figured you could step up and help me bring him some holiday joy. Me, already suspecting that something is very suspicious here. What do you mean that your gift budget is already strained? Well, my car broke down and I decided to buy a new one. Me, well, that's unfortunate. Hopefully your new car is reliable. Sure is. I decided to treat myself to an early Christmas gift and bought one of those brand new Cadillac Escalades. I just so happened to have my Chromebook in front of me during the call, so I used it to look up the MSRP for a new Escalade, which had a starting price of above $75,000. At that moment, a very cold anger had started to arise in me, much akin to my previous encounter with the entitled mom. Here she is, again trying to take advantage of me just to get a PS5 for her kid while she blows money on a Cadillac. 
she could have bought a much cheaper car and could still have money left over for multiple PS5s and could have still had money left over to buy gifts for multiple families. My wife could see that I was not in a good mood and looked concerned as I walked into my office. I may have been nice to the entitled mom before, but this time I was going to give her a piece of my mind. Entitled mom. So, going back to the PS5, if you could get one with a few games. Me, cutting her off. No. Excuse me? Me, I will not be buying your son a PS5 for Christmas. But he really wants one. Are you going to deny a kid's wish? Me, let me tell you something about my charitable giving. It goes to families that barely have enough to get by at the end of the day and are staring down the barrel of choosing between rent or Christmas gifts. Not entitled people like you who have poor spending habits. Entitled mom scuffs. Why, I never. How dare you? Me, look who's talking. You obviously have more than enough money to purchase an SUV that costs more than a blue collar income. Yet here you are trying to bum a free PS5 off of me? All because your budget is strained? If your budget is so strained, then why don't you sell that overpriced car and buy one yourself? You should watch your tongue. You know, the Bible says that the younger generations should be subject to your elders. This pushed me over the edge. At this point, I was fuming and had decided it was time to burn a bridge with Entitled Mom. Me. You know what? Maybe if you spent more time actually reading your Bible instead of thumping it all the time, you'd actually be more thoughtful of people other than yourself. Heck, maybe you'd be the one doing the Secret Santa. Don't you ever call my phone again. Clearly, you are someone who is not worth wasting my time on. I'd wish you a Merry Christmas, but maybe even that's too good for you. Hangs up. I blocked the number and proceeded to text my friend to make sure that his aunt never contacts me again. Oddly enough, I didn't need to take time to calm down. Telling Entitled Mom off was actually quite cathartic. My Karen sister expects me to hand over $20,000. Let me give you the relevant background. Me, 32, female, and my twin sister have a great uncle. He and his husband are child-free and we are the only kids in the whole family. When we were high school freshmen, he set us down and told us that he would like to leave us his practice, orthodontics, to us if we wanted him to. I agreed and worked hard for it. My sister, on the other hand, always wanted to be a homemaker. Nothing wrong with that. When we were accepted to college, he paid for mine and gave an equal amount to her that she used on a big wedding and a grand honeymoon. Her husband has a great job, but they've always been deep in debt because they like to keep up with the Joneses. New car each year, grand vacations, kids in private schools, and a ton of extracurriculars. Two years ago, I finally was able to join my uncle's practice, so he transferred everything to my name and left his huge paid-off house and a gated community to my sister. Then he and his husband moved to Florida to live the life. It was just bad luck that a few months later, lockdown hit and the practice started suffering. And that's when my sister started on the gloating about how she was the smarter twin in the end, how she ended up with a paid-for house and a great family, while I was an old maid with a worthless practice. I ignored her remarks the same as I've been doing for years. Then restrictions eased and I started making money. I just bought a condo and a Tesla. Two days ago, she invited me, then she asked me for $20,000. Apparently, they took a mortgage on the house because her husband lost his job and now they are behind on their house payments, car payments, all the bills, and the kids' tuition. I was sympathetic, offered to help her budget, said that if they gave back their cars, I could pay the difference and get them a used one. Also, that I would get them current on essential bills and get them food, but that was that. She got angry, said I was a bad sister, and that I was lording the fact that I was a successful doctor over her, that I wanted to see her brought low. I couldn't accept the disrespect in my own house, so I asked her to leave and to only contact me when she was ready to apologize and act rational about her situation. She called me a jerk and left. Then she blocked me from everywhere and went whining to our parents. I still think that I'm in the right, but I don't want to see my nephews and niece become homeless. So am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If you start handing money over now, it will never stop. Family are the worst when it comes to money, bar none. If she's not willing to shift and budget, she is literally just wanting your money. It has nothing to do with keeping a roof over her head. If things were that bad, she would be okay budgeting. This is an issue they brought on themselves, and if you bail them out now, 
you will be bailing them out for years. Do not become the family ATM. Not the jerk. They can apply for assistance like everyone else. They're also both able-bodied adults, so if they want to maintain an extravagant lifestyle, they can get jobs to support it. You are quite generous to offer to help them catch up and buy food. That's more than most people struggling right now have help with. You're not obligated to help her at all, yet you did, despite her insults during the shutdown. Your sister needs to grow up, and if your parents are enabling her behavior, they can go into debt helping her if they want to. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. Sister made her bed, now she gets to lie in it. Am I the jerk for getting mad at my boyfriend for saying I don't deserve the money I make? I'm a 28-year-old woman, and I got really lucky to get the job I have right now. I studied electrical and computer engineering in college and job hopped four times. Each time I switched jobs, I negotiated really hard for pay and benefits. I'm making 160 grand now, working remotely and living in a very low cost of living area. It's a really nice gig and I recognize I'm extremely lucky to have interests that line up with a super well-paying industry and super lucky to have been able to go to college at all. But despite that, I feel like I did work to deserve it somewhat. College was super demanding and difficult. My first few jobs had grueling schedules and I feel like I'm being paid more for the knowledge I built over all that time. But still, I have to admit, it's pretty cushy. I never work over 40 hours a week. My coworkers never contact me about work outside of my 9 to 5. I get paid stupid good money for it and I have two months vacation time. So on to the conflict. My boyfriend used to work outside the home. He's an IT admin at a large company. But because of the lockdown, his job became partially remote. So we're working out of the same house and I think he sees how different our jobs and pay are. He makes 65 grand a year and works a lot longer hours. He usually starts his day at 7 or 8 a.m. and works until 6 or 7 p.m. He more often has to work weekends to do IT stuff and he's on call for emergencies with his personal phone. And it seems like they're having emergencies every week. So, since we've been working from home together, he makes comments about it occasionally, like, must be nice, kinds of things. Recently, he's gotten more frustrated with me though. Yesterday, I had a bad headache, so I told my boss that I was going to be away from my desk for a while since I wasn't feeling well. I blocked out a two-hour meeting on my calendar so people wouldn't try and reach me and I took a nap. My boyfriend saw me napping during work and said, They're really paying you to sleep, huh? I snapped at him, saying that they were paying me for my skills and that I didn't care for the way he had been talking about my job. He said something petty about my skills at napping and wasting time on Zoom and how that's definitely worth six figures and I got really irritated and said that just because he was underpaid doesn't mean that he could call me overpaid and if he was mad, he should go take that out on his boss, not me. He said that I was being ridiculous. He'd be in trouble at work if he did. I said maybe he needs to find a better job if his boss isn't ready to talk money. He called me privileged and out of touch and said that it isn't that easy to just go find a better job. I said that if you don't try, you're never going to know. He got irritated and stormed out. Am I the jerk for how I talked to my boyfriend about work? Not the jerk. So you've worked hard in college and you've got a great degree, changed jobs four times and gone through the new job grill, cracked four interviews, negotiated well, work a full-time job, and you talk like it's all easy and you're not doing anything major? Girl, you don't appreciate yourself, and I think it might have something to do with your man. I make more than my husband, and not once has my husband spoken to me like this. You need to get out, because he's not going to understand or change. This is who he is. He's jealous and petty and insecure. If he can't let you nap when you have a headache, he doesn't love you. I'm sorry, but the longer you stay, you're totally going to stop loving yourself. Talk to a few friends, talk to a therapist, get your thoughts and feelings in order, and get out. Everyone sucks here. You're not the jerk for being successful. I bet you did work hard to get to where you are, and you seem genuinely aware that you also got extremely lucky. That said, you are privileged. You do have special advantages most people do not have, both with your salary and being able to nap at work, and you do sound a little out of touch with how difficult it is for your partner in his field. And you're the jerk for talking to him as though his problems are all his fault and easy to solve. Similarly, he's the jerk for being passive-aggressive towards you. 
You guys need to have an honest and open conversation acknowledging your behaviors and feelings around this issue along with the mistakes you've both made in relating to one another. Then talk about what you can each do to relate to each other in a more constructive way moving forward. Good luck, OP. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. Who needs to quit that belly aching? If Reddit boy over here made as much as she does, I'd probably actually love him. Am I the jerk for laughing at a child-free woman wanting to be a housewife? I've been online dating for quite a while. My profile very clearly states, I'm dating with marriage as the end goal. I matched a few weeks ago with a charming woman who said she also was dating with the intent to get married, with the caveat of wanting a traditional relationship where she would be a housewife. I agree that I would be happy with that arrangement in the future. We chat about a variety of subjects and set up a date for an early dinner two weeks out, today. Much to my surprise, during the date, she casually mentioned she doesn't want to have kids. In my confusion, I ask her, but you said you were looking to become a housewife. She responds, you can be a housewife and still not want kids. Admittedly, I did chuckle, but it wasn't a full belly roar of a laugh, just a chuckle. She took great offense to my laugh and asks, why can't I be child free and a housewife? My response was, what will you be doing all day? She says, what do older housewives do after their kids go off on their own? My response was, usually back to work. I told her it's going to be next to impossible to find a man willing to take that deal. She gets angry and leaves. I tell my sister and she thinks I crushed that poor woman's dreams. Am I the jerk for telling her the truth? You're the jerk. It is incredibly rude to laugh in someone's face who is being genuine and honest with you. It's also not that crazy that if her future partner makes enough that she doesn't need to work, then she can stay home. My wife didn't work for several years before we even decided to have kids. I didn't want her to have to work. Seems pretty dumb to me to take up someone's free time for no real reason. Again, as long as finances can be managed by one of you, what will she do? Watch TV, see her family and friends, be stress-free feel happier. I don't know why you wouldn't want that for the person you love if you have the opportunity to provide it. You may think her way of thinking is childish as you smugly laughed at the premise. It is even more childish to live in this world where everything needs to be fair and if I have to work, you have to work too. Not the jerk. Everyone in this thread is like, she wants to stay home and do nothing? How dare you laugh at her? If the roles were reversed, he's a lazy freeloader. Don't let him be a worthless bum on your dime. I'm going to get downvoted to heck, but I've seen far too many of the reversed posts where it immediately means the man is a worthless bum. Everyone does chores around the house. If you're child free, get a job. You don't get to laze about every day with minimal duties and expect everyone to accept you. Will she find a partner willing? Probably. But does it need to be you and is your laughing a jerk move? No, not the jerk. This thread is ridiculous. What do you think? Was OP the jerk for laughing when she said this to him or not? Please let us know. At least he took her on a date. You haven't taken me anywhere since 1999. I no longer help out customers as much as I used to, and for good reason. I work at an AT&T based cell phone service retailer. Started two to three months ago and have overall loved it and have exceeded at it. I also got nothing but great reviews and people always generally considering me very helpful and indeed I try to be but not as much as I used to. No, not at all. And that's because some customers ruin it for everyone else. Let me tell you a little story. It was once a late dark evening in September and a couple walked into our store, looking to join our service. Everything was going well, we got along. I helped them out and showed them our selection of phones and plans. They both ended up buying new cell phones and everyone was happy. I could have left it right there, but decided to be a good Samaritan and go the extra step by asking the couple if they wanted help setting up their email. Bad idea. At first, they eagerly said yes and thanked me, so I opened up Gmail on each of their phones and got started. The wife was able to set up her email just fine, but the chap on the other hand, he forgot his email password. We tried every which way to reset his password or bypass it, but nothing worked. This is when, suddenly, all heck broke loose. The man started breathing heavily, almost hyperventilating, and his fists clenched up. He then suddenly screamed, Rah! 
and got up and proceeded to smash his phone into the ground while grunting and breathing like a wild beast. He then exited the store and continued to smash the phone. <laughs> Y'all didn't call the police? To smash the phone some more on the open concrete until it was reduced to pieces. While I stood there half shooked, half confused, and half concerned for my own safety, his wife was just sitting there scrolling through her phone as if, <laughs> as if nothing happened and just simply said in a gentle laughing tone, I don't know why he's freaking out. Ha! As if she was fully used to this behavior. I then handed her their bag and they went on their way. I just stood there alone for a minute in the open silence, reflecting on what the heck just happened. And suddenly, I remembered what one of those people who trained me a few months back said to me in response to when I asked him what his main philosophy of dealing with customers is. He replied, as soon as the customer walks in, I try to get them out of my face as quickly as humanly possible. At first, I disagreed with him because I value customer service, but now I'm starting to think he was right. OP, it's nice of you to go the extra mile. I am slash was the same way. Going the extra effort for my customers. I still don't regret it. I'm just more strategic nowadays. Your job requirements ended once they made the purchase. Setting up the email was not a variable of the transaction. What might seem like an easy and quick thing to do, as you can tell, can spiral into something completely different. Yeah, I'll say. I believe you got off easy here. They could have easily blamed you for the email not working. They could have then wanted to return the gear. No sale for you and all that time wasted. They could have talked to your manager saying that you invaded their privacy in regards to the email. Even if nothing went wrong, you might have lost out on a potential sale or customer that walked in halfway through your email setup. There are a lot of downsides to what you did. Just take it as a learning lesson for next time. Am I the jerk for getting mad because my girlfriend let her brother stay in our apartment without permission? Uh-oh. I, 23, male, and my girlfriend, 21, female, have been dating for two years. I started dating her because I was attracted to her intelligence. She always gave me good advice in work and personal matters. She is very successful career-wise and doesn't let anyone walk over her. But I have been questioning this impression of her lately. I moved in with her six months after we started dating. Her brother, then 16, was already living with her at the time as their parents had passed. To be honest, it was uncomfortable living with a third person because I couldn't spend quality time with my girlfriend and I could tell her brother didn't like me. I put up with it because he was still a kid and I felt bad for their situation. Last month, the brother turned 18. Although my girlfriend's name is on the contract, I help pay the bills and do chores around the house. But the brother has never contributed financially. It's not like he can't. He's worked part-time jobs since he was 15. But my girlfriend refuses to let him pay to stay with us because he needs the money for his college fund. I was fine with this until he became an adult. Now he should have to do his part and I told him as such. He said he would do more chores and run errands instead of paying because he doesn't have money, despite having two part-time jobs. So I went to my girlfriend about it. She said that if I felt the split wasn't fair, she would pay two-thirds of the rent on behalf of her brother and I could pay the rest. I started to get angry then and told her that it's not right for her to be letting an adult man leech off of us. I made it very clear that the brother shouldn't be living with us now that he's no longer a minor. He has been constantly leeching off my girlfriend by letting her pay for his tuition fees, college applications, etc., while giving nothing in return. When both of them started ignoring me, I packed up the brother's stuff and told him to leave. My girlfriend went totally nuts. She threw a fit and said that I was overstepping my boundaries. She went on this spiel about how her family is her top priority, even though I'm the one who supported her for the last couple years and how I had no right to bully an 18-year-old. When I tried to explain how she's being a pushover for letting her brother walk all over her, she screamed to get out and never come back. I was obviously shocked at being kicked out of my own home, so I refused and she threatened me with the police. I grabbed my stuff and went, and I'm now waiting for her to get over it so I can return. I've had to stay on a friend's couch for the last few days because my girlfriend of two years cares about doing everything for another man, completely ignoring how she overstepped my boundaries by allowing an outsider in our place. Am I the jerk for getting upset? Edit. I want to make it clear that I didn't immediately try to throw out the brother when he turned 18. 
I spoke to both of them multiple times explaining the situation, but it was ignored. I tried talking about it for half a month before doing this as a last resort. Edit 2. After some consideration, I've decided that finding my own place and living arrangements will be for the better. Clearly, my girlfriend refuses to place any responsibility on her brother, so he'll be there for who knows how long. I'll wait for her to unblock me and get in contact to have a serious discussion about our relationship, and hopefully, we'll both apologize for losing our cool and move on. If not, well, there are plenty of fish in the sea. You're the jerk. Wow, everything in this entire post was me, me, me. Your girlfriend undertook one of the most difficult things a person can go through and is doing a great job at it. And all you can talk about is yourself and how you feel about it. Nothing about how amazing she is and how a lesser person would crumble. Little appreciation. You're bitter, and if you don't change, this relationship is going to move on without you. You are the jerk. You are the outsider. Her brother is more than her brother. She's taken on a parental role when the parents passed. She's helping him and guiding him to being an adult. Were you kicked out the moment you turned 18? Were you expected to pay rent as a teenager? Did your parents help you with college applications? I sincerely hope your girlfriend comes to her senses and completely ends things with you. You're the jerk. Dude, I can't believe this needs to be explained to you. First, she's not doing all of these things for another man. It's her brother, who she has raised for the past few years after their parents passed. I mean, good on her. Second, you moved in with them. You don't get to just kick him out when he was there first. Didn't like living with a third person? Too bad. That's what you agreed to when you moved in with her and her brother. Your girlfriend is taking on the role of his parent because they don't have any. That means supporting him, including financially, if she so chooses, which she has. Of course she's choosing him over you because she's not the jerk. You are. This isn't going to change. You moved into their home. You act like some jerk stepfather who wants to ship the kids off to boot camp as soon as he's married the mom. Remember when you said at the very beginning of this how she doesn't let anyone walk all over her? That includes you. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for how he acted or not? Please let us know. I think jerk would be an understatement to be honest. Why is the music so loud? I work at an office supply store. This happened to my coworker and I saw it all go down. A lady comes in asking if we fix printers. She shoves a really beat up machine on the counter. Coworker. Unfortunately, we don't. However, there's another store down the street called Redacted that does. I can tell you how to get there if you want. Karen. What do you mean you don't? You fixed my last printer. Coworker. Oh, I see. Well, we don't have any specific printer fixing tools or anything. Are you sure it was this store? Yes. Ah, well, maybe we did in the past, but we don't currently fix them. Sorry about that. It goes back and forth like this for a few minutes while the lady absolutely insists that we fix printers, as if we're just pretending not to, simply for the sake of being a jerk. Eventually, she seems like she's about to relent, but points something else out. Why is the music so loud? For reference, we have the usual generic music playing over the intercoms like every retail establishment in America. It's not at an inappropriate volume by any means. I'd turn it down if I could, just because the songs are repetitive, but that's neither here nor there. Coworker. I'm sorry, I have no control over the sound system. Can't you go turn it down? No ma'am, I can't. It's all set by corporate. We can't adjust the volume or change the songs or anything. They actually call us if we try to adjust it. But it's too loud! I'm sorry ma'am. Come on, there has to be something you can do about it. What if I came in here and just started screaming at everyone? I'd call a manager over to ask you to leave. Okay, so call a manager to have them turn down the music. He does. Our manager comes up and basically repeats the exact same information about how there's nothing we can do. She sits there like a deer in the headlights for about 10 seconds. Well, that's unacceptable to me. Manager, I'm sorry ma'am. She proceeds to slam her printer on the desk and speed walks out of the store. As always with these customers, we spend the next five minutes ruthlessly mocking her when she's out of earshot. I'm not the lab tech, but you have given me a urine sample before. I work as a dentist in a really small rural town about an hour outside of our mid-sized city of about 250,000 people. 
Because I'm one of the only dentists in town, and because I'm the only one that will do more complicated extractions and root canals, I dress in surgical scrubs every day. I got tired of laundering bloodstains out of my dress shirts and white lab jackets. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with AFib. I visit my cardiologist about every six months just to keep him in business. This last time, as I was checking in at his front desk at the hospital for my appointment, I apparently offended the giant lady behind me by having to update my insurance information and address with a nice lady behind the desk. I was midway through giving nice lady my new address when Karen taps me aggressively on the shoulder. Can't you guys talk on your lunch break or something? I've got another appointment after this. Immediately, I turn on my impassive expressionless face I use with my own agitated patients. Rather than responding immediately, I finished giving my information to nice lady. When I was done, I turned to face Karen, who was not pleased with my delayed response. I'm not a small man. The word husky has been thrown around a time or two. But I felt small standing there with her glaring down at me. I think you've confused the situation here, ma'am. I'm a patient here checking in for my appointment. As soon as nice lady is done with me, I'll go sit down and you can check in. I thought I was polite, but I think nice lady was smirking or grinning behind me because Karen just about had an aneurysm on the spot. I've been coming here for six years, she shrieked. I just stared at her evenly. I know you've drawn my blood before. I just kept staring blankly for a moment, then said, no, I haven't. I'm a dentist. And at that moment, I remembered her. She had been an emergency patient I had seen one time only for a toothache years before when I worked in a practice here in town. It had been a catastrophic visit and she never came back. She remembered me at that same moment and she saw in my expression that I remembered her. Oh yeah, was all she said and stepped back. I quickly wrapped up my business with nice lady and meekly sat in a chair. Karen eventually made her way into the waiting room and sat with her back resolutely towards me until I was called back by the nurse. I went through my cardiology checkup and had forgotten about my GL by the time I was done. As I went to leave, I waved at nice lady on my way out. Pro tip, always be extra polite and kind to the office support staff. They have way, way more influence over your provider's attitude towards you than you realize. How you treat them can influence how your doctor treats you. Nice lady waved me over before I left and told me in a quiet voice that I was the first person to ever shut Karen down mid-attack. I guess Karen is in there at least monthly, and she is always rude and demanding, and most people, being intimidated by her size, just defer and let her have her way. I just smiled and said, Huh, guess I'm just lucky. She smiled and I walked off. I am not lucky. What I couldn't say because of HIPAA, American law governing the share of personal health information, is that when Karen was my patient, for exactly one visit, I had pulled a really loose infected tooth for her. After the really simple extraction, as I was placing some gauze over the bleeding hole and telling her to relax in the chair and not stand up too fast if she felt lightheaded, she did exactly that. She stood straight up, immediately swayed, and passed out, crashing headfirst over the chair into the tray of used instruments. The chair completely gave out and collapsed, screaming and groaning to the floor. Karen went to the bathroom in her collapse, and the smell literally made my assistant wretch. We spent the next few hurried minutes getting her revived and on oxygen. I'm not a small guy, as I've said, but we could not physically move her, and once she was down, apparently she could not physically move herself either. She had to lay there over our twisted chair, breathing on oxygen, yelling and bleeding from her mouth, in a pool of her own waste for a solid 15 minutes until six burly EMS guys could squeeze into our little overcrowded operatory to hoist her up and escort her out to the ambulance. She was not pleased. She apparently recovered and lived to make the lives of other healthcare workers full of interest and entertainment. The chair, however, did not recover. It had to be replaced. I've seen her one other time since then in the far off distance of Walmart, putting along laboriously on a motorized cart. I guess the moral of the story is, that if you are going to aggressively mistake someone as a lazy employee of your doctor, make sure first that he's not someone you already know from an extremely embarrassing prior encounter. Am I the jerk for walking out of a practice after my substitute swim coach told me I couldn't? For some background, I, 15 female, have been swimming competitively for a club team for a little over 7 years, which means I know every coach very well and have been coached by almost all of them at some point. I also work for the swim team and teach swim lessons to the younger kids. 
This is an official job. I have a work permit and receive consistent pay for teaching these lessons. I teach swim lessons for the team twice a week. The lessons are scheduled to start 10 minutes after my practice gets done. So if I am coaching, I typically get out of practice about 5 to 10 minutes early so I can shower and change. My supervisor likes us to be a few minutes early and I also like to look presentable at least and be a good role model to the kids. The other day, my current coach, 30-ish male, wasn't able to make our practice, which doesn't happen very often. Instead of canceling practice, another one of my coaches, 50-ish female, took his place. We all knew this coach very well and I personally had her as a coach for three and a half years. She had a lot of experience and was constantly going to conventions to learn how to coach her swimmers better. My typical coach is very aware that I leave early on these days, as it has been going on for several weeks. When I saw we had the other coach for the day, I immediately went up to her and told her I would be getting out early. She replied by saying 10 minutes was plenty of time. I tried to explain that the job started in 10 minutes and I needed to be there early, but she insisted that 10 minutes was enough. At this point in my life, saving up for a car, I prioritized my job over athletics and decided I would be leaving when I needed to, no matter what she said. About 10 minutes early, I got out of the pool and put my equipment away. The substitute coach stopped me and told me to get back in the pool and finish my current set, which would be ending in a few minutes after practice should end actually. I repeated myself, telling her that I had to leave to get ready for work, but she told me again to put my cap back on. I then proceeded to tell her how I admired her as a coach. She was always learning new coaching techniques, and she had so much experience and knowledge, but I needed to leave. I calmly stated that my job isn't optional, and that my supervisor expected me to be there early. Even after all this, she was still upset and told me to get back in the pool. I firmly said that I was not asking for permission, I was telling her I was leaving, and then walked out. She was gone by the time I returned to the pool deck to begin work. I have never stood up to an adult like that, and I'm wondering if I made the right decision. I don't want her to tell my normal coach and have him be upset either. Am I the jerk? Edit. Wow, that blew up fast. I didn't expect such a large response so quickly. I thought I should add that my supervisor has expressed he likes us there early. My normal coach is also fully aware of my schedule. Additionally, I am paid for the full hour. The lesson is only 50 minutes, but we have to gather equipment and organize the kids before it starts, so I like to be early because I am being paid for those 10 minutes before we start. Thanks for all the feedback. Karen wants to give birth to her baby at my house. My brother has made a really weird request of me. He asked me if him and his girlfriend could use my house to give birth at. I didn't even know what he was getting at at first, but he explained to me that their apartment doesn't have a bathtub. It's too small for an inflatable pool and it would attract too much attention if the birth was there and the neighbors will likely call the authorities. I have a house instead of an apartment and I have a bathtub and more room than them. My brother thinks I should be honored about this. I thought this was so weird. I thought they would go to the hospital, like normal, but they haven't used a doctor at all, so I have no idea how it works and if the hospital would ask who their doctor is. My brother said I don't have to be there if I feel uncomfortable. I don't have a problem with him or his girlfriend, but I feel strange at the thought of leaving the two of them alone in my house. I'm a guy and I don't have kids, so I admit to no experience in this area, but I'm also worried something could go wrong because neither my brother nor his girlfriend are doctors or have any medical training. My brother and his girlfriend have been saying how upset they'll be if I say no, that the mother being comfortable is what's most important and I shouldn't deny her and that I'll look like a jerk if I turn down their request because they don't have a backup house. I just don't get why they can't go to the hospital, even though I have not said it. My mom also hinted one time to me it would be a nice thing to do. Would I be the jerk if I didn't let them use my house for the birth? Because it makes me feel weird and uncomfortable, and I would prefer they use a hospital? Not the jerk. I would not feel comfortable with a first-time birth with no medical backup planned in my home. I mean, it's a strange request anyway. Plus, it requires a lot of flexibility. You could be on call for four weeks with everything that entails and then potentially not get your home back quickly afterwards, even if all goes perfectly. Direct them to find a doula or medical advice and go from there. There's no need to lend them your home. You would not be the jerk. This is a weird ask. It also comes with other questions and planning. How far do they live from you? 
Would they expect to live in your house for the last month of her pregnancy? Babies are notorious for showing up on their schedule and no one else's. It's kind of their thing. This would mean that you'd have to have an area prepped for a couple of weeks just in case. It's not a simple matter of them popping up at 6.30 for a 7 p.m. reservation next Tuesday. Do they have a midwife? Where will she or he stay? Is someone else going to provide the supplies like towels and such? You're the jerk. The fact that your brother and his wife are even willing to welcome their baby into the world in your home is a huge honor. You refusing this opportunity speaks volumes about you and your lack of respect for them. Don't be surprised if slash when they cut contact. Edit. Downvote me all you want. I could really care less. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let them have the baby in your house or not? Please let us know. Tell them to head over to our house. We've got a spare bathroom. They can pay in installments if they have to. Entitled sister-in-law stole our baby's name. Now she regrets it. My wife and I spent four years trying to get pregnant before the wrong side of 35. We are currently 33, respectively now, and are blessed with a wonderful infant son. My wife has a younger half-sister that she has been low contact with for some time. The woman is entitled and toxic, and her mother's golden child. We've refused to let her or my mother-in-law in the house since they both blatantly tried to make off with my wife's jewelry box a couple of years ago. The box contained a lot of valuable jewelry inherited from my wife's grandmother. Said jewelry is now in a safety deposit box, as per my suggestion. My wife and I had nearly given up trying to conceive when it suddenly happened, and we were ecstatic. After we found out we were having a baby, we started looking into names. I ended up suggesting the name of my Scottish grandfather, and my wife loved it. So that's the name we settled on. But we made the mistake of posting about it on social media. Well, no surprise to the stereotype in this mess, my sister-in-law was pregnant too, and was months further along than my wife and also having a boy. She decided to claim my grandfather's name for her own son, and not just the first name, but the middle name too. We called her upset over what she was doing, and she smugly told us there's nothing we can do about it, which she was sort of right. There was nothing we could do about it legally, as it's not a crime to steal planned babies' names. We realized that drama was exactly what my sister-in-law wanted, and she thought that by taking the name for herself, we'd not be able to use it. I laughed and told her that while what she did was dirty and underhanded, we would keep our chosen name, and she could just deal with it whether she decides to go through with copying us or not. Well, my sister-in-law's baby daddy called me and said I was an unreasonable jerk for still wanting to use the name after sister-in-law claimed it. I said she claimed nothing, and since we couldn't own the name, then neither could they. Before he ended the call, he threatened me by saying I'd be sorry if we didn't change the name. Then he hung up before I could respond. Months later, sister-in-law has a healthy baby boy and names him my grandfather's name. We did not show up for the birth, both because of the lockdown and because we simply didn't care to be there. Sister-in-law called us wanting congratulations, but we told her we simply didn't care and that if she was still insisting we change our baby's name, then she'd be in for some big disappointment because we were not. Sister-in-law demanded I put my wife on the phone, but it was already on speaker, and my wife spoke up and said she agrees with me entirely. We weren't changing the name. Sister-in-law hung up on us, but soon started sending emails with text walls of names, even suggesting similar ones. I responded back that the name was from my grandfather, and that's why we were not changing it. They shut up and we didn't hear from her again till after our son was born. Two months later, we were blessed with our son. He came out perfect and we named him just as we had intended. Well, no surprise, my sister-in-law called us a few days after the birth to scream in our ears that we had copied her son's name. I pointed out that she was the real copycat since she had no familial ties to the name and we did. And anyone who looks at our family trees could see that. Then my wife spoke and said after the attempted theft of her grandmother's jewelry, she no longer considered sister-in-law her sister and would have nothing to do with her nephew either. For months, we were bombarded with messages and emails from my wife's side of the family. Half were on our side after finding out the whole story, the other half were not. And sister-in-law's baby daddy, true to his word, showed up at my door to make me sorry. I'm not sure what his plan was, but I pretty much towered over him. 
I'm six foot one and well built from regular exercise and three trips to the gym a week. He, on the other hand, was very skinny and about five foot six with a baby face that was badly hidden by a slim beard. I told him my house has cameras and to get off my property and never come back. He just yelled at me and drove off in his beat up old car. Sister-in-law and mother-in-law called us from a different number to yell at me for making sister-in-law's baby daddy feel emasculated. I didn't even threaten the man. I just told him to leave and not to come back. And if he didn't want to feel emasculated, then he shouldn't have come knocking. Then they tried to bring up the issue of the baby name again and demanded we change our son's name as he's so young, so there's still plenty of time to do it. We held our ground and told them that they were bonkers to still think they were in the right after they copied our choice of name just to try and get one over on us. I said sister-in-law didn't even name her son out of love but out of spite just to try and stick it to my wife for no good reason. Then my wife called them both out on the way she was treated growing up, how entitled sister-in-law and mother-in-law have always been and how she was glad to leave them far behind and she wants nothing from them and they won't have anything from us. That left sister-in-law sobbing and mother-in-law called me a royal jerk before hanging up the phone. There was no contact again for a little while till sister-in-law called us again some time later to bitterly tell us we had won. She and her baby daddy got in a huge fight and he left. He was apparently very sore that sister-in-law didn't let him even give their son a middle name from his family. And he said he was sick of the BS and wanted his son named after him and not some guy he wasn't even related to. Sister-in-law finally caved and they got the boy's birth certificate reissued with a completely new name, which cost sister-in-law around $500, or so she claims. Sister-in-law then demanded we at least compensate her for the name change plus another $100 for the emotional damage, as now she's going to have to get used to calling her son by a different name. We laughed and said this would have never happened if she hadn't stole our baby name to begin with, and we didn't owe her anything. Since then, we've been no contact with sister-in-law and mother-in-law. But my father-in-law, who's a very nice man and divorced from mother-in-law for obvious reasons, would come by often and loves his grandson. From what he and other relatives told us, the situation between sister-in-law and her baby daddy was pretty tumultuous. But we don't care. Not our monkeys, not our circus. Am I the jerk for evicting him and his 13-year-old daughter? My boyfriend, who's 34, of three years just moved in to my 32 female, three bedroom home five months ago. This home has been in my family for the past 70 years. I have a five-year-old son and my boyfriend has a 13-year-old daughter. I made sure I moved all of my stuff out of my office and put it in the loft so she could have her own bedroom. I think it was about a month into him living here that his daughter wanted to move in with us full-time as she doesn't have her own bedroom at her mom's. I was completely fine with this. Anyways, I started running into a lot of problems not even a week after she moved in full-time. She became really entitled and demanding, like demanding that my son trade rooms with her because it has a bigger closet and pitched a fit when I said no, or demanding we buy her expensive clothes or makeup because I'm a real estate agent and I have loads of money. Call me crazy, but I'm not about to drop $120 on a pair of ripped up jeans or drop $200 on three pieces of makeup. Her dad works, but his income is significantly less than mine, so she really just expected me to be the one who spoils her rotten, or pushing her plate of food away and saying, I'm not eating that, but you can cook me something else. I can deal with her childish tantrums and slamming doors, but she has now started to put holes in my walls, and my boyfriend makes excuses saying he used to do the same thing and she will grow out of it. She torments my son. If he says anything to her, she literally always responds with, Oh, you're talking to me? Swap rooms with me and I will think about responding. Her dad literally never attempts to correct her behavior and I'm told I'm being too harsh if I do. The tip of the mountain for me here was two weeks ago. There was a foul smell coming from her room, so I asked her to clean it because you couldn't see the floor. She said, Um, no, it's my room so I don't see why you have any say on how I treat my personal space. Her father actually agreed with her. Three days later, the smell had become so bad that I lost it. I told her to clean it or she was moving out. This was after I saw at least six used personal hygiene products thrown throughout her room 
as well as half-eaten food and moldy drink cups. She starts crying and saying I'm treating her like she is Cinderella and I'm acting like an evil stepmom. I told my boyfriend either he handles it or they're both gone. He clearly didn't believe me because he told me that I needed to lighten up because his daughter is having a rough time transitioning and being away from her mom. I gave it a week. Nothing changed. I went and got an eviction notice drawn up and gave them 30 days to vacate my property and told him he's lucky I'm not suing for damages. He says I'm the jerk for throwing away three years because I can't handle not having my own way. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Oh heck no. He's a bad father for letting his daughter behave that way and then getting angry at you for putting your foot down on her greedy and disgusting behavior. Yeah, bye. Like father, like daughter. You're definitely not the jerk here. I don't know why you would think otherwise. So what if she has to share a room with a sibling when she moves back in with her mom? It's not like she's homeless. I mean, I feel like maybe she'd benefit from therapy and learning some empathy, but this is so beyond the pale for a parent to deal with, especially when she's allowed to get away with it. In addition, this type of behavior is something your son should not be witnessing, let alone be around someone so out of control they're putting holes in your home and making at least one room a near biohazard. I'd also be worried about how your now ex boyfriend would treat your son. Not the jerk. He's not parenting her. A parent steps in and protects both kids and he's allowing his daughter to mistreat what would have been a sibling. That's not remotely acceptable, let alone the amount of disregard this child has for any authority figure. She has anger problems and thinks it's perfectly acceptable behavior to damage property when she's upset. She's not a toddler, but she sure is acting like it. You have your son's emotional health to worry about. They are not homeless, they have their mom's house or other family to turn to. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you evict him and his daughter or not? Please let us know. I'd call the authorities is what I'd do. That little animal needs to be in a cage. Am I the jerk for telling my dad that if he chooses to attend my stepbrother's graduation, then he better forget about me? I'm an only child and my 18 female parents divorced when I was eight. My dad remarried when I was 12 and for a while everything was fine. But after a few years of living there with them, I started to notice that my dad preferred my stepbrother, who's 13 now. They did more things together and started to ditch me to go to his games, his plays, his tournaments. For every 10 things I invited him to, he only attended one, maybe two. His wife always gave excuses. Her son is younger than me. They are really close. His dad is not involved and told me that at least I was lucky to have a dad with me and specifically one who was willing to share his love. Well, my mom told him sad crap and gathered all the things to aim for sole custody when I was 13 and won it. Only then I saw my dad being hurt for me being taken away. I started to spend some time with my dad, but only if he picked me up to do it. He still missed most of my things and I've always resented him and his other family for it. Since this is my last year, I had a lot of significant activities. I had my last debate, my last volleyball game, I won best essay in my class, got into best 20 alumni, and finally went to pick my prom dress. Some, if not all of these things, he missed because he was working or attending something regarding his family and I can't have it anymore. My graduation is December 15th, the same as my stepbrother's elementary school, and when I told dad, he said that he would see if he could make it, which meant he wouldn't, so I came clear. I said that while graduating elementary school is nice and yay for him, I'm graduating high school and I'm on my way to university, so he can't really compare those things. And if he chooses my stepbrother's graduation, he better forget about me. His wife flipped and told me that I was taking my stepbrother's dad away from a big day and I was being a spoiled brat. I told her that I couldn't be a spoiled brat if I was being ignored the whole time and that I wasn't talking to her. My dad looked shocked, so I said that he could be there for once or he can miss forever and left. But now that I'm cooled off, I'm starting to feel bad. I love my dad to pieces. I just want him there for me too, and I surely don't want to hurt my stepbrother. I was wondering if I was the jerk for acting how I did because he's paying half of my college fund and I gave him an ultimatum. Plus, my dad is not prone to confrontation while my mother and I are. Not the jerk. Your ultimatum might have been a little bit intense, but I don't blame you for it. Years of observing and experiencing neglect wears on a person. You're 100% right. An elementary graduation doesn't compare to a high school one. 
Don't let anyone gaslight you into believing that your milestone doesn't trump an elementary school graduation. Your stepmom sounds like a nightmare, and she's probably been more behind your father's time management than you realize. Her disillusion that your dad has more parental responsibility to her son than he does to you is bananas. If you feel like you need to clear the air with your dad, I would suggest speaking to him in a place free of your stepmom and being ready to lay all of this on the table for him to see. He must have had the impression that his absence hasn't been bothering you, but I think it's time he woke up. Not the jerk. Not to hijack your story, but I went through something similar. My dad was in the military and started a second family after he and my mother divorced. He spent his leave time with them. When my older brother graduated, he didn't show up. When my graduation was coming, he told me he could not come because he had to take classes for work. I fell apart. I told him I didn't have to understand because I had done nothing but understand for 11 years. I told him I deserved to have him there and it wasn't my fault that he had missed so much. He was stunned. He also came to my graduation. Our relationship improved tenfold. We are very close now. I share this because it is somewhat similar to your experience. I don't know what would have happened if he hadn't come, but I know I would not have regretted calling him out. It isn't your fault that your stepbrother's father passed. It isn't your fault that your graduation and his event happened on the same day. You do not deserve to miss out on having your father there. Not the jerk. My dad did a bit of the same. Never showed up for anything concerning us. Never had money for us. Never took the time to make time for us, but he would do it all when he had stepkids. When he had stepkids, he became neglectful to his biological kids and would go back to being more attentive when single, which was rare. Fast forward nearly 15 years after my mom got full custody of me and we are extremely low contact. We wish each other happy birthday by text. That's it. He doesn't know my medical history and doesn't care. Doesn't know where I live now after I lost my previous apartment to a fire where he had a girlfriend at the time and made sure I knew I couldn't go live at his place even if he had three empty bedrooms. I never asked and wouldn't have considered an invite, but still. He knows I'm engaged because his brother saw the announcement on Facebook and refused to meet my fiance. Heck, I'm pregnant and don't intend to tell him. His neglect made both of us stop caring and sometimes he asks my brother why. Why don't I reach out? Why don't I care? And I really don't care. When I needed him, he was neglectful and why would I care now that I don't need him? It's a natural progression. You are fighting for this lack of care not happening in your relationship. I never did. You're putting your sanity on the line to keep him in your life, but relationships are a two-way street and you just reminded your dad of that. You cannot be the only one to try, the only one to send invitations, or the only one to care. He needs to realize that before it's too late. But I would look into therapy right now for yourself to talk about those fears he won't show up and about this unhealthy relationship. You need to learn to set boundaries in a healthy, non-emotional way because yelling ultimatums is not healthy and can backfire on you. All in all, you deserve better, and your dad is a blind idiot that needs a kick where the sun don't shine. You can use extension cords. A few years ago, I was looking at a garage rental space for a workshop. I met with the landlord and everything looked great, except that there was only one outlet in this huge space and it was at the completely wrong end of the building. I asked the guy about the electric, explaining I needed to run tools. He said, yeah, that's fine and I won't charge you for electric. I said, okay, awesome. Is there any way I can have another outlet added further out in the space? He seemed very confused and asked why I couldn't just use extension cords. I explained that I'd have to run one over 100 feet and it would cross over the garage door entrance and I'd be worried about the resistance tripping the breaker, which I didn't have any access to. Again, he seemed very confused. I simplified my explanation again, figuring he didn't know much about electrics, and he said, okay, we can definitely talk about adding an outlet. So with my electrical concerns addressed, I agreed to come back the next day to put down a deposit and sign the lease. The next day I arrive, check in hand, and once again ask him about the electric. He again seems very confused with my issue, again asking why I can't just use extension cords. I patiently explain again, this time saying, well, the junction box is right here. I could just run another line and I'll do everything to code. He says no, saying he doesn't want me messing with the electric. I figured he's concerned with insurance, so I say, what if I hired an electrician to do it and paid him for it? It would make the space more attractive to future tenants. But again, he disagreed and this time said, I think you should just use extension cords. At this point, I was torn. 
I wanted this space. It was a reasonable price and size, but the electric was very important as well. I pushed the issue one more time, but again he wouldn't relent and said, I don't want anyone messing with the electrical. Okay, fine. Me. Would you mind if I hung up the extension cords on the top of the wall so it's out of the way? Him. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Me. So it's okay if I screw or staple the wires up? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Okay. So I signed the lease and a few days later went to the hardware store. Bought 250 feet of 12 by 3 Romex, electrical house wire for those not familiar. An outlet box, an outlet, and a pack of wire staples, and a heavy-duty plug end. I looked up the local electrical code and went to town. I wired up an extra outlet just as an electrician would, complete with to code wiring placement and staples and all, and then ran it to the existing outlet and terminated it into the heavy duty plug. I effectively made a really nice extension cord. This worked perfectly, never popped the breaker, and was a lot safer than running a random extension cord across the building. The best part was his reaction. He didn't notice until I was about to leave and I asked him if he wanted me to take it down. He said, wait, you did that? I thought that was just wiring that was already here. Then when I pointed out to him that he could just have it spliced into the junction box by an electrician, he was impressed and said, no, that's fine, you can leave it. Am I the jerk for admitting to my husband that I wasn't actually happy on our wedding day? I, 30 female, have been with my husband for seven years and married for four of them. I love him and I'm genuinely happy with our marriage and the life we've built together with our kids. I was happy the day he proposed. I was happy during our honeymoon. We've had our ups and downs ever since, but overall I would say that I was happy. Although, I wasn't happy during the planning and actual wedding. Why? Because it wasn't the wedding I wanted. A few months into the engagement, my husband's grandmother was diagnosed with cancer and wasn't expected to live long. Our wedding was predicted to be the last big family event that she would ever attend. Of course, I felt sad and was more than willing to change the date of the wedding to better suit her needs. But what I was not expecting was that it would become her wedding and I was to be treated like a figure on a playset. She picked out the venue, the color scheme, the food, music, the flowers, and even my dress. It all started out as subtle suggestions, but when I started to try and put my foot down, I was called a heartless bridezilla who couldn't honor a dying woman's request. And the fact that they were paying very little into the actual wedding would be a jerk thing to bring up. After a fight, my husband was told to reconsider the engagement if I couldn't do this one thing and how a wedding was more important to me than actually becoming a part of the family. Knowing that I'd never win, I sat in my car and cried for an hour, mourning the loss of the wedding I wanted and in the end, let the in-laws have their way. I didn't even attend further meetings to discuss the planning and left both the bridal shower and bachelorette party early. Once the actual day arrived, I swallowed my disappointment and just went through the motions. Since then, my sister and best friend each had their weddings and I was maid of honor for both and was excited each time. I took my role very seriously and had a lot of fun. My cousin is getting married and asked me to be her maid of honor and I jumped at the chance. Recently, I've been spending hours on the phone and Zoom putting together a planning binder. My husband took note of my enthusiasm and made a joke about missing that energy on our day and brushed it off. After that, I cut down my wedding planning in his presence, but he wouldn't let up citing that we don't keep any wedding photos out, that I got rid of my dress as soon as I could, and how I looked so much more happy at someone else's wedding than our own. He wouldn't let up and eventually we got into a fight where I finally confessed that while I love him, I hated our wedding. My husband is now hurt and giving me this silent treatment. Am I the jerk? Edit. I stepped away for a little bit, but I'm already getting so many wonderful comments and messages. Thank you so much for validating my feels, although there are some things that I wanted to clear up first. 1. My husband's grandma passed a few months after we came back from the honeymoon and she recounted our wedding as being one of the happiest moments of her final days, so I made the decision to not bring up how much it wasn't a good day for me, so my husband and I never really talked about our wedding in this way until now. 2. While I am into super planner mode for my cousin's wedding, I'm strictly adhering to the bride and groom get final say rule because I don't want to make others feel how I did. Hence the binder, so if they shoot down one suggestion, we've got three others. Not the jerk. I just don't understand. Even the dress? Like, when they told you the dress they wanted you to wear and you said no, 
they called you a bridezilla? Did you not respond with, just to understand, I'm the bride, it's my wedding. Am I really not allowed to choose the dress I'm going to get married in? I'm a bridezilla because I want to wear a dress at my wedding that I like and choose myself? Did any of you not choose your own dress at your own weddings? I have no issue with grandma choosing things as well, but she got to plan her own wedding and wasn't called a bridezilla. Is my opinion at my own wedding really less? It's great that you moved up the wedding for her, but your husband is the jerk for not protecting you, for not putting his foot down. Ask him if he knows anyone else in his family that didn't get to choose their own wedding dress. Not the jerk. Every time you try to have something of your wedding for yourself, you are gaslit with guilt to make you conform to what they wanted. You're allowed to be upset over that. Your husband still doesn't understand this. Tell him, she won the other foot and hypothetically, it's my mom passing and everything you want for our wedding is denied because it's not what she wants. She picks the color, your suit, every important detail and you're not allowed to have an opinion because she's passing. You're basically a doll that's getting dressed up and going through the motions of a day that you thought you would have had more of a hand in considering it's your darn wedding. Then try and see it from my point of view. New neighbor won't stop blowing leaves. OMG y'all, the neighbors from heck have moved in next door. This man cannot sit still apparently and has done more yard work than any person should reasonably do unless they're landscapers. It's every single day. I'd hoped once fall arrived, it would calm down, but nope. Just to give y'all an idea, we live in a rural area, but it's a neighborhood where you can shake hands with your neighbors from your kitchen window. Built in 1975, when people wanted neighbors close or something. I've lived here my whole life, bought the house for my parents, and no one in this neighborhood is this loud. He's blowing leaves every single day for hours. Because we live in the country, there's tons of trees, and because no one else takes, and it's Oklahoma. Wind brings leaves from up the street into his and our yard, so most people just don't bother. I've always felt it's better for the grass, it's fertilizer. Not like leaves are going to hurt anything. Anyway, I normally just deal with it, but today, I've got a migraine. My bedroom window is literally right next to this guy's driveway. After two hours, I peeled myself out of bed, put on clothes, and went to literally beg him to stop for the day. Y'all, I literally got on my knees, hands together, and begged this jerk to stop. Two hours later, he's still out there fighting the losing battle with leaves. They just moved in about four months ago, and he has alienated every single neighbor with his obsessive yard work. I know this because I posted on next door how rude he was to me. Basically told me, sorry, but not going to stop. Put on headphones and stop complaining. And everyone on my street and the street behind me jumped in to complain about him. Why did they have to move in here? Reply. Same with us and the downstairs neighbor who treats his patio as a wood shop, storage, and garage. He never stops building, hammering, drilling, all day, sometimes overnight. Every single day. Going on three years now. Next spring, we're out of here. He seems to be unemployed. From early mornings, he's out there. He never sits down. Not only is he altering the apartment that he doesn't own inside and out, He's building robots made out of household items and he takes them out even at midnight underneath our bedrooms to test them. This patio is right underneath our bedrooms. Check your noise ordinance laws. If he's violating the hours, call the cops. OP. Wow, he seems to know the nuisance laws because he makes sure to only be working during those hours. I usually ignore it, but when I've got a migraine it's nearly impossible. What kind of selfish jerk continues doing something after a neighbor literally begs them not to for a legitimate reason? Just one day was all I was asking for. His response? When will I get rid of my leaves then? I wanted to yell, look you jerk, all I'm asking for is one day without you making a ton of noise. Is that too much to ask, you jerk? Plus, you aren't getting rid of them. You're blowing them into my yard. Jerk, I really want to move, but we are stuck. Karen's sister-in-law gets banned from our Thanksgiving this year. My mother-in-law and I do not get along, but I'm really proud to say we call this ceasefire for the sake of my husband. I know this might sound childish, but it took blood, sweat, and tears for us to even be in the same room. Mother-in-law did some awful things to me, and it took work to forgive her. I did some things I'm not proud of, but at some point I realized I was just hurting my husband. Mother-in-law was an absolute monster at our wedding. She made planning a nightmare. She embarrassed me at my bridal shower. 
and she wore something that could have passed for a wedding gown. Right after the wedding, we had a financial setback and had to stay with mother-in-law. I know this is petty and not defending it, but I was still upset about the wedding. Mother-in-law was having some guy over and demanded we hide ourselves away. She really, really liked this guy, cooked a fancy dinner, and spent like an hour getting dressed. So, I messed with the dinner she cooked and poured flour on her when the doorbell rang. Again, I'm not defending it right now, but we were in this awful war mindset. Yeah, mother-in-law kicked us out of the house for that stunt, and eventually I grew up and reached out to make peace. That was two years ago, and mother-in-law is still with him, and they're getting married in January. I've apologized to her. She's never going to apologize to me, but we've made our peace. We bought our first house recently and had a large dinner party. Also, I'm hosting Thanksgiving this year. Mother-in-law said I can have it because it's the worst holiday, but hey, it's a start. Everyone knows how excited I am about finally having a house to host in. At the dinner party, mother-in-law was getting a lot of attention for being engaged and people wanting wedding details, and sister-in-law decided to give a toast about how she knew her future stepfather was the right guy because he stuck around after that incident, and she told everyone about it in detail, and he calmed mother-in-law down and made her dinner while she washed the flour off. I get sister-in-law's point, but it was humiliating. Also, it paints an unfair picture because she left out all the crap mother-in-law has done to me. Most of my guests were horrified. This was supposed to be a nice adult evening and she's bringing up how immature I was right out of college. Mother-in-law laughed. Father-in-law laughed because he is her ex and loves the flower story, but everyone else was in shock and it made the vibe really weird. I called sister-in-law out after the party and she laughed and said it was a funny story. I told her it was humiliating and she said, well, it was true. I said, as of right now, she's banned from the house because she disrespected me in my own house. This means Thanksgiving since it's coming up. Mother-in-law asked me to reconsider because, well, you did do that. And because sister-in-law doesn't have anyone else to spend Thanksgiving with. I stood firm and now mother-in-law is saying she will stay home and cook for sister-in-law. My husband is mad at his mom for picking sister-in-law, but said he will back me. Sister-in-law swears she was just kidding and I'm overreacting. You're the jerk. If you want things to change, big if, you're going to have to get on the high road and stay there no matter what the provocation. If you do that long enough, either they'll stop provoking you or you'll stop minding. A win for you no matter what. For me, when I feel righteous indignation, it's a red flag that I'm about to make a childish mistake. It's easier to take the high road if I stay off my high horse. You're the jerk. You sound mean. You did a thing that obviously everyone knows about, but you obviously aren't over it and are somehow using that to exclude your sister-in-law from a family gathering? Also, regardless of the rift between you and mother-in-law, you were living under her roof and tried to sabotage a date that turned into a lifelong relationship? Come on, grow up and get some perspective. You're just asking for future wars with that attitude. Everyone sucks here, but in degrees. Regardless of what mother-in-law did, your behavior was extremely childish. You poured flour on her because of her wedding behavior when she was putting a roof over your head? You were lucky she didn't grab something and defend herself. Frankly, that they could turn it into a funny story and laugh about it is a good thing. Instead, they could still be telling people what an awful jerk your husband married. It's embarrassing, yes, and sister-in-law was not thoughtful to repeat it, but banning her from the holiday table was overdoing it. Of course mom is going to celebrate the holiday with her daughter since you banned her, your husband shouldn't be surprised, neither should you. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or sister-in-law? Please let us know. If y'all had a reality show, I would totally watch it. Am I the jerk for deliberately ruining my friend's surprise birthday party? My friend Kate's 25th birthday party was last week, and a few weeks earlier, her boyfriend Rob contacted me to help him plan a surprise party for her. Basically, the plan was for me to drive her to the city so we could have a lunch to celebrate together, just the two of us, because some of our other friends and Rob wouldn't be free that day. Except they actually were all free and would be waiting there for us, and he'd rented out and decorated a private room in a restaurant. Essentially, I just needed not to divulge the truth, which I had no problem doing until the day of, when we were driving down together. Kate suddenly got very melancholy and said how she doesn't think Rob cares for her. They've been dating four years. He can't even take off work for her birthday 
and he probably hasn't planned anything at all. She was really starting to work herself up and even began crying. I came clean and told Kate what was going on and asked her to pretend to be surprised for everyone's benefit. She cheered up considerably in the moment and thanked me for reassuring her, but she's not a great actor. So when the moment came, she didn't act surprised and then let slip that I'd told her beforehand. Rob is now pretty mad at me for ruining the surprise and says I should have found a different way to reassure her that he and our friends still care for her. Our mutual friends are divided on this. Kate isn't mad, but did mention it was a shame that the surprise aspect was ruined. I honestly don't think I'm the jerk here, but will accept others' input. Edit. Dang, y'all are just as divided as my friend group. The not the jerks seem to be coming from people who hate surprise parties for themselves, of which I am one personally, so maybe that's where my knee-jerk response came from. Not the jerk. You had a crying friend on the verge of a breakdown, believing that nobody liked her and that her birthday was forgotten. That must have been an uncomfortable sight, and you told her about the surprise to cheer her up. There was nothing malicious in your actions, and you were put on the spot. I'm sure everyone will say, you ruined the surprise, and you should have done X or Y, but hindsight is 2020. You had to make a judgment call, and whilst it may not have been the right one, it at least reassured your friend she was loved, and she didn't need to work herself up. Edit. Another point I'd like to bring up is OP was driving at the time. To all the people who are saying she should have said X, Y, and Z, maybe the reason OP didn't have time to think of an excuse was because she was on the road and perhaps mostly concentrating on her driving. You're the jerk. Count me in as a person who hates actively trying to make someone feel unscared for in order to make a surprise more impactful. I would not be happy if I was thrown a surprise party. That being said, it seems like Kate was okay with her boyfriend's surprise. It also seems like she would have been comforted by you simply saying, I'm sure Rob has planned something special. He really cares about you. So because your reaction seems more about how you would have felt in Kate's shoes instead of what would have actually worked best for Kate, you're the jerk. Even though I agree with you about surprises, there were many ways to comfort her without spoiling things. Not the jerk. Why is it so many people value the boyfriend's achievement of surprise higher than the emotional comfort of the girlfriend? That being said, I'm sure there would have been better ways to comfort her, like someone suggested. Tell her that boyfriend was working on something for some other time or whatever. But as you can see, even though I have all the time in the world to come up with a different scenario or two or three, they all escape me. I can imagine that you must have been under quite some more stress being in that situation. So yes, despite there being better options, I'll give you a pass for that. What do you think? Is OP a jerk for ruining the surprise party or not? Please let us know. Her heart was in the right place. I don't think she's a jerk. Just a surprise party ruiner, that's all. Am I the jerk for calling my wife selfish for refusing to come to my sister's wedding out of jealousy? When I met my wife, my family, not this specific sister, were jerks to her. My mom found her annoying and said she shouldn't have to interact at all. And when I didn't let that fly, she was very rude to my girlfriend. My younger sister said I was ruining our family and became very aggressive. I had to cut them out of my life, which was the hardest thing I've ever done. I still have a hard time thinking about that, I can just never speak to my mom again. But I knew that was what I had to do to be a good husband. My middle sister was never really involved. When I cut my mom out, my younger sister cut me out, and my middle sister, Jane, said she would stand by me, though she thought I should fix things with our mom. My wife and I have two beautiful kids, and Jane is the only one in the family who has ever met them, and really the only person I have left from my family of origin. My mom wasn't at my wedding, and I've never met her husband, never met my niece from my other sister, and it still makes me sad. Due to the issues with my mom, my wife and I had a tiny wedding. It was just the courthouse and a few friends. I know that wasn't her childhood dream. She's totally the princess type who had been dreaming about a wedding since she was a child. My mom had always said she would pay for mine, but obviously didn't. My mom got married a year after I did and I found my wife creeping on her social media and looking at the pictures and crying. I comforted her the best I could, but she was very upset that my mom didn't deserve it and that she would never get the chance to have her own wedding. Now, Jane is getting married and my mom is paying for everything. My mom has a lot of money and I know Jane's wedding is going to be over the top. I'm going to be walking Jane down the aisle. My mom and other sister will be there, but we've seen them plenty of times during the no contact and it has never been an issue. Neither are interested in resuming contact and they stay away from us. 
My wife said her issue is completely about how much it hurts to see Jane get the wedding she didn't get, and she said she isn't going to come with me because it will hurt too badly. I asked her to reconsider because I'll feel awkward being there on my own and Jane is the only family I have left. My wife said she's sorry, but it just hurts too much to see someone else have a big wedding. Since our wedding, she has avoided others and declined being a bridesmaid a couple years ago because she said she couldn't get childcare, which wasn't true and she knew I could get those days off work. I called her selfish for not coming to Jane's wedding and said I feel that she doesn't care about me and cares more about a party. My wife was absolutely devastated and said I invalidated her feelings and I didn't try to understand. Things have been awkward for the past two days over what I said. Not the jerk. Honestly, from reading all that, I see why your mom and other sister don't like her. Stalking your mom's social media and crying over her wedding photos? Refusing to go to your middle sister's wedding because she didn't get the dream wedding she wanted? I'm sorry, but your wife is way too hung up on this wedding she never had, which I get, but at the same time, she's letting that influence how she treats the sister that didn't do anything to her, and that's not right. Not the jerk. A wedding is a significant milestone in Jane's life, and she deserves to celebrate it with her family, including her sister-in-law, your wife. There's no reason why your wife won't come to her wedding besides her jealousy. She's jealous and insecure and is willing to compromise your and her relationship with Jane because she can't control her intense jealousy. Jane will know she didn't come to the wedding because she didn't want to and not because she couldn't. It's utterly transparent. You can definitely get a babysitter for your kids months in advance. Expecting her to believe it is just assuming she's ignorant. There's no excuse to circumvent the wedding invitation. People do above and beyond to show up to their family's weddings. It's a minor effort to arrange things such as time off of work or childcare for the kids during this time. The spying on others and then gossiping about them is petty as well. Jane was the only one supporting her and she's reciprocating her this way out of sheer selfishness and envy. She's an ingrate and she demonstrates a complete lack of consideration, gratitude, and goodwill. Let's put all the unkindness towards your wife to the side for one moment and talk about her wedding. Why did you guys have a small wedding? Were you both always counting on your mother's money to fund your wedding? When I was married, none of the parents paid for anything and we had an awesome wedding. I don't see why your family had anything whatsoever to do with what kind of wedding you had. Is she just upset that she didn't get the money from her mother-in-law that she had hoped for? It seems a very strange thing to rely on. What am I missing? Well, who do you think is acting like the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I'm worried for her to be honest. That level of jealousy towards someone who's done nothing to her seems it could be a bit unhealthy. Hurry up and keep changing your tire. Um, okay. This was many, many years ago, but it sticks in my mind to this day. I was a contracted service provider, tow truck driver, for a major roadside assistance slash travel organization, though the company I worked for was quite small. I had been sent to a lakeside neighborhood in my popular northwest city, a neighborhood full of hip restaurants and cutesy boutiques, to change a tire on a new BMW. This was back when all cars had a spare tire, which should tell you how long ago this was. I had my own tools, but for the new BMWs, it was always recommended to use the tools that came with the car, since they were less likely to cause damage. I had no problem with that, since the jack that came with the car was quite easy to use. It had a crank instead of a jack handle. The only issue was that there needed to be enough clearance between the jack and nearby immovable objects, such as, say, a curb. This particular vehicle was parked very close to the curb. My normal SOP is to ask the customer to slowly move the car away from the curb to avoid damage to the rim of the flat tire. No one has an issue with this, normally. The chucklehead owner of the vehicle refused to move it, claiming that it was going to ruin the tire. I told him that if he moved it slowly, it wouldn't damage anything. He wasn't buying it. I pointed out that the tire was already flat and likely needed to be replaced anyway, so no problem. He screeched at me, telling me to get on with it and change the tire because he had places to be. Ah, <sighs> So I got to it, wanting to be clear of this chump as quickly as possible. This car's jack had a very low gear ratio, requiring several turns to lift the car even an inch, but the force required to turn the crank was not excessive enabling the user to quickly turn the crank until the car was raised sufficiently. The issue with the car being too close to the curb is that while the jack's crank has a hinge to fold it compactly when stored, 
the crank must be unfolded completely to provide adequate leverage to turn and lift the car. But with it so close to the curb, the bottom of the arc of the crank's movement caused the handle to just barely clear the curb. Only problem was that I was holding the crank as it came around to the curb. Not enough room between the crank handle and the curb for my fat fingers. Yes, as a matter of fact, I did skin two knuckles down to the bone, with the scars still present to this day. And yes, I did use some colorful, unprofessional language. Captain Chucklehead heard this and smugly announced that he was going to report my horrifying language and get me fired. He then reiterated his desire for me to get the lead out and finish changing the tire. Oh, really? See, my first aid kit was back in the truck, several dozen yards away. Well, since I didn't want to delay this person's day any longer than absolutely necessary, I just continued to change the tire, splattering crimson jewels of blood on the rim of the flat, on the spare, on the jack, on the lug wrench, on the fender. I made sure not to waste a single cell on the ground. I even managed to get a nice fat drippy drop on the window. His face went pale as he saw the biohazard scene unfolding all over his precious car. I even made him sign the form with a blood smeared pen, though I gave him the opportunity to get his own. After he nearly caused an accident leaving the parking space, probably on his way to the car wash, I was then able to tend to my poor knuckles and get ready for whatever else the day would bring. Never heard a single squawk from my boss or from corporate. Forget that guy. Am I the jerk for refusing to testify for my dad in court? My mom and dad split up when my brother, 24 male, and I, 25 female, were very young. Since then, dad has brought home lots of girlfriends who do not last long. We have a half-sister, Diana, who's 10, born in 2011. My dad and her mom share custody. In 2019, his girlfriend at the time, Laura, who was told she was infertile and was 40, got pregnant. She told my dad the baby was a miracle and she was going to keep him. My dad was very clear from the start that he's not happy with having another kid, that it's Laura's project and that he feels too old, 58, to have a new baby. Laura told him he could have the part he wanted in the baby's life. My half-brother, Leo, was born a year and a half ago. He's very cute and happy. My dad was proud when he was born, showing pictures to everyone and all. For around 8 to 10 months, Laura and Leo lived at my dad's. However, whenever I would call him at that time and ask, how are you, he would reply angrily that he was obviously not well, having been trapped into having a new baby that he did not want, that he was deprived of his freedom, and is overall upset with having to take care of two kids, Diana and Leo. He would openly say that in front of Diana and Leo. He began treating Laura worse and worse, and just leaving all the time during the weeks or weekends, so Laura would have to take care of Leo and Diana. She has health problems and had two heart attacks during that time, so he reluctantly took care of my siblings when she was recovering, but she still did the cooking, dishes, and stuff. After that time, Laura and Dad talked things through, and Laura decides it's best if she moves out to another city, a city where my dad goes vacationing a lot because he has a boat there, where she can get her own apartment, she has her own job, and so that Dad can come see her and Leo when he feels like it, without feeling trapped. He agrees and she moves starts building a good life for her and Leo, subscribes to a sports club, meets new friends, Leo is at childcare near home, etc. Laura keeps in touch with the whole family and we're welcome to stay at hers anytime. Fast forward a few weeks and my dad is telling everyone she's a horrible monster for taking Leo away from his dad and siblings. He would go to the city she's at, randomly, ask to see Leo and bring him back to his house in another city for a few days. Laura does not know when she's seeing Leo again. When she refused to let him see Leo for a few days, 18 days, because she can't stand the uncertainty and needs my dad to respect his schedule, he has gone to Leo's daycare, taken Leo and just left without her knowing. Laura has filed a lawsuit against him to obtain full custody and my dad would have the right to visit Leo on the weekends and vacation under a fixed schedule. My dad wants me to testify for him in court, but in my opinion, he brought this on himself. I refuse to testify for him and he now refuses to talk to me. Am I the jerk? Edit. Thank you all so much for your comments, inputs, and for sharing your personal stories. I feel very relieved that the consensus is that I'm not the jerk. In fact, my dad is. I'll put into practice all the very good advice I've gotten on how to handle my relationship with him, or lack thereof, and with my siblings. My dad has also asked my brother, 24 male, to testify for him, and my brother has told me he doesn't know what to do. I don't know if I'll show him this thread, 
but I sure have a lot of arguments now to convince him not to testify. Not the jerk. You should absolutely testify, just not on his behalf. What your dad is doing is wrong, and I hope Laura is successful in protecting her son from him. Does Diana's mother know that your father badmouths his daughter in front of her? Because I also want Diana protected from him. OP. Yes, she does. I think he asked her to testify as well, and she also refused for the moment. She does not want to get involved as to not jeopardize the relationship she has with him and not affect Diana too much. As for testifying against him, I have considered it. If Laura is not successful and the matter goes to higher courts, I just don't want to get involved if I can avoid it. I don't want my dad to never talk to me again. Edit. I should add that I am not from the US, so the US legal system does not apply here. In my country, I will be able to give a new testimony before the court of appeal in a custody case. I'm in the legal field, so can vouch for this. I will also triple check with Laura's lawyer when I get to speak to her. Ever serve someone you think was trying to provoke a confrontation by not tipping? Had a guy with a $43 tab, sirloin and a lemonade, pay with $43 cash. From his manner with the first thing he said to me, I knew it was going to be a stiff, but he still got the best service I can give with eight tables active at dinner. Any delay that occurred was due to our kitchen being understaffed and overwhelmed, rang his stuff in within 15 seconds of him ordering and homie got his food immediately after it popped in the window. After dude paid and I counted the cash and closed the check, I could almost feel him trying to gauge my reaction and it might be in my head but I swear he wanted me to say something to him so he could do a little bit about entitlement or something, I don't know. Like it cost me a couple bucks to serve him but whatever, like seriously? I don't really give a hoot about 10 bucks one way or the other anymore, but it did make me wonder if this is something other servers or bar have felt before. Usually a stiff is just that, but I swear it had some kind of experimental vibe, or maybe the dude was trying to make a TikTok, or maybe I'm a narcissist with main character syndrome. But still, anyone else where it walked like a duck and quacked like a duck, but it was a goose egg? Update. So my guy came back in tonight. I think he was maybe kind of surprised since I was bar last night and main dining room tonight. I decided again against making it an issue and gave him the most aggressively good service I could manage. Had his iced tea and bread within 45 seconds of taking his drink order, had the calamari out about two and a half minutes after that, entree out the second it hit the window, check already ready in hand when he asked for it with half of his entree left to eat, wished him very enthusiastically a fantastic evening. He left 20 on 55. I'm still not certain if it was to balance out last night or if it was some sort of test that I had passed or what. Regardless, it helped balance out the couple inevitable rough Sunday night tables. Reply. Absolutely. I had a guy literally ask me if I wanted to know why he didn't tip me. I knew that he got excellent service and there was nothing wrong with his experience, so I simply said, nope, tipping is optional. So he asked me again if I wanted to know. I said, nope. Tipping is optional and it's your right to choose not to tip. He asked me a third time if I wanted to know why he didn't leave a tip and I have to endure his ridiculous ego because he's asking me this while using our handheld debit machines so I can't easily exit the situation. I need to wait for his transaction to process. Finally, when his transaction was complete, I say for the last time, nope, tipping is optional and you have a great day and finally escape. Thankfully, one of my other tables overheard the whole thing and expressed their disgust with his behavior and left me a generous tip to make up for his jerkness. Reply I had a seemingly lovely group of women in their 30s and they were flirting and joking with me the whole time. Then the check came and it was $79, so they gave me $80. So I said, I'll be right back with your change, to which one of them said, Oh, you better, as they all laughed. I get back and hand them the dollar and some change and they asked, So, you have to tip out at the end of the night, right? How much is it? Typically, it's 3% of my total sales. So, you're paying a couple bucks to serve us? That sucks. They all laughed and left the restaurant. Am I the jerk for refusing to take my name off the deed to my mother-in-law's home? Me and my partner have been together for eight years, married for two of them. Five years ago, we bought a home together, a small two-bedroom unit, just to see if we could coexist without ending one another with the intention of only staying a few years before we got married and then upgraded to something larger. Three years on, we had enough of a deposit to do just that when my partner's mother came to us asking for help. She wanted to buy a place but didn't have anything in the way of savings. 
she was tired of renting as it was becoming more and more expensive. We talked about the issue, knowing that if we agreed to help, it meant delaying our own upgrade by a further three years at minimum. With some hesitation on our part, we nevertheless did the right thing and helped out his mother by giving her $90,000, the sum total of all of our savings at the time, making it clear it was just a loan, and she bought a place also with the aid of her other son. Recently, my partner has been talking to me about getting my name taken off the documentation to the house, so it is only her name and her two sons on all the paperwork. I know his mother has been in his ear about it, because he only ever brings it up after a solo visit to her. For a while, I avoided the conversation, but recently, my husband has had an actual conversation with a lawyer to draw up paperwork to have my name legally removed. When I found out, I told my husband we needed to have a serious talk, and I told him honestly that I would not remove my name from the documentation, because, to date, his mother has not paid either of us back a single cent of the money we lent her. This angered my husband, who said I had agreed to take my name off the documentation. That's why he spoke to a lawyer in the first place. When I insisted, I never agreed, and that I was just protecting us both by insisting our names stay on all the documentation, he called me paranoid that his mother would never cheat us. Now I feel guilty. Am I the jerk for refusing to remove my name from the documentation, seeing as I did help pay for the place she bought? And without our help, she would still be stuck renting. Not the jerk. Your mother-in-law has already cheated the two of you by not paying back the $90,000 you lent her. I wouldn't take my name off a single thing until every dollar loaned was repaid, in full. Not payments that can be dragged out over years or forgotten about. If this isn't acceptable, then you might want to suggest they sell the house and pay you back what is owed. Not the jerk. And your husband tried to gaslight you. I would talk to a lawyer of my own, and it's time to start demanding the money mother-in-law owes to start being repaid. You were incredibly generous, but now you need to ensure you won't be ripped off. Why is he wanting your name off? His calling you paranoid is unacceptable. If anything, you need to check that he has not forgiven the loan behind your back and that his existence is legally binding. Please report back. To be honest, I would be going for a lawyer and a trial separation in your place. Never lend money to family. Don't call ladies girls. That's what somebody wrote on the receipt of their 10% tip. I, 24 male, served a group of seven ladies that came in for lunch. They were all approximately late 30s. We had two servers on and it was pretty busy lunch rush. On top of a few inside and outside tables, I had a party of 12 I was finishing when they sat and they were arriving little by little. When they all arrive, I say, hey, did you girls need a few minutes or could I grab anyone anything? One of them volunteered to start, went around and got the whole order. Everyone was nice, polite, totally perfect. We have a two-course lunch meal, appetizer and an entree. Of course, when it's busy, the food will take a bit longer considering the kitchen has to wait for our fire tickets. I get their apps out and for bigger tables during lunch, I always fire them immediately, especially this time since the kitchen's busy. I also must add, at this point, they're one of the two tables sitting outside in the 40 degree weather. We still had plenty of room inside. I'm busy inside at a computer and one lady approaches me and says they need their entrees now since they need to get back to a meeting. Mind you, they said nothing about being in a rush the six plus times I've been at the table already. Nonetheless, when they ordered, I say they'll be a few minutes and I literally told her I didn't know her group was in a rush. I don't assume that of any table unless they tell me they're on a time frame. Why not just get fast food? A few minutes later, I'm running the food out and the same lady meets me halfway and says they want it all to go. And the check. I get that, but like, of course, I sort of just negotiated with her and dropped the food to the table and gave them boxes. They paid and left. On the bottom of the receipt, it read, Stop calling ladies girls. Reply. Many, many moons ago, my week-long training before they opened a new olive garden in my town included a portion on using language like this. Using anything which could be misinterpreted was highly discouraged, especially guys. Using folks and y'all seems to be the most neutral, and I've never gotten myself in trouble since switching to those two. Likewise, we were trained to never say no problem because it's no and problem. That one I've actually taken to heart. Even in casual conversation, I now say things like happy to or my pleasure, and I've actually been complimented on being so positive all the time. It's fake positivity, mind you, but it seems to work. 
Karen wife demands my son's college fund. I've been married to my wife for three years. I have a 16-year-old son from my previous marriage and his grandparents and I are on good terms. We've set up a joint account to contribute towards his college fund. The problem started when my wife requested that I pull money from my son's college fund to pay for a C-section in a private hospital. I declined her request and refused to even negotiate. She complained about how I didn't seem to care about her or our son's well-being even though there was nothing to worry about in terms of health. Yes, every medical procedure has its own risks, but the local free hospitals we have are decent and offer great care. All family members and friends had their kids there. She disagreed and criticized the poor service local hospitals have and insisted that this was a big deal since it concerned both her and our son's health. I tried assuring her, saying she will be fine, but she argued that I have no idea what it's like and told me if I refuse to put money towards the CSE, then I shouldn't be surprised when she puts her maiden name on our son's birth certificate instead of my family's name. I refused as I saw no need to waste money on private hospitals when we had free service and care available. She stopped bringing it up and days later she had a scheduled CS at the local hospital and I wasn't allowed to be at the hospital and I respected her wish. I only saw my son when she came home and I was shocked to learn she went ahead and put her maiden name on the birth certificate. I immediately went off on her, but she said I caused this and claimed I was obviously favoring my oldest over my youngest before he was even born. I said she was dead wrong and called her petty and vengeful for doing this purely to punish me solely for the fact that I was unable to afford a private hospital. Her family watched and she told me to step out of the room, but I said we weren't finished talking. She started crying and her mom got involved and told me to step out because I was stressing her daughter out. I had an argument with her too and asked if she approves of any part of her daughter's behavior and she just shook her head telling me to calm down and give her some time to rest. She said no, but I bear blame too for disregarding my wife's needs after she made them clear and pointed out that pulling some money for the private hospital wouldn't hurt. But my parents disagreed and are upset and refusing to even visit, calling my wife unhinged and toxic. Not the jerk. Your wife sounds petty and exhausting. I get that pregnancy is stressful, but that's no excuse for acting maliciously. She has no right to dictate what to do with the money you put aside for your teenage son. The baby she had is yours too, so her decision to give him only her name was nothing but spiteful. Not the jerk. If your wife wanted to give birth in a private hospital, she should have made that clear from the start so that you could both save up for it. Deciding last minute that you need to steal from your kid's college fund is absolutely ridiculous and entitled. Getting revenge by not allowing you into the delivery room, not allowing you to meet your kid until she came home, and giving him her maiden name is absolutely shocking. There are so many red flags, she is incredibly toxic. Has she always been like this? What's her relationship with a stepson like? You're the jerk. Wow, I guess I'm the only one here, so bring on the downvotes. Your wife is about to give birth to her first kid. She's worried that the quality of health care that she will receive in this incredibly painful and vulnerable moment in her life is not good enough. Instead of taking her seriously, trying to understand why she's concerned and potentially brainstorming for other ways to get the money to pay for the treatment, you laugh in her face and tell her she should be fine with the free stuff. Sure, easy for you to say as it's not your body that will potentially burst open and then get upset the kid doesn't get your last name like it's 1950. You're a huge jerk and I hope she divorces you. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Stealing the stepson's college fund is just sick. I'd kick Karen out is what I'd do. Am I the jerk for not letting my daughter go to her homecoming dance? My daughter is 14 and a freshman in high school. She came home one day after being at her mother's for a week. We split custody and wrote homecoming on our calendar and starts talking about all the plans she's made with her best friend to go to homecoming together. Homecoming week happened to fall on a week she was with me. She starts raving to my wife and I about the dress her mom took her to buy and that she's matching with her friend. She had even bought a ticket already. I was furious with her entitlement to just make up all these plans without asking me first. I can admit it's not just her fault, but her mother's as well for not clearing it with me before buying her the dress and ticket. In fact, I wouldn't put it past her and her mother to have bought the dress and ticket before asking in order to force me into letting her go. 
I want to teach her a lesson about asking first and not assuming that I'm just going to let her do whatever she wants and that she can't manipulate people in order to get her way. So I told her that if she had asked first, I'd be happy to let her go to her homecoming dance. But since she decided to make plans and buy stuff before even asking if she could go, I wasn't going to let her. She cried and told me that you can only get one freshman homecoming, and I told her that maybe she should have thought about that. I said all homecomings are the same anyway, that she has three more opportunities to go and she's not missing much. She sulked in her room for the rest of the day and didn't talk much. I tried to comfort her, but my wife said not to because I'd be teaching her that I'll give her my attention if she acts upset and cries. I went to comfort her anyway because I didn't think she was acting, but she rejected me. That infuriated me even more, so I left her in her room to cry alone. Her mother was furious when she found out and demanded that I pay her back the money she spent on the dress and homecoming ticket. I said absolutely not because she didn't clear it with me before buying those things, so it's her own fault. However, she contacted her attorney, who contacted mine, and long story short, I got to sit down with my wife and our family therapist for a painstaking conversation about communication. It's now long after homecoming and my daughter is pretty much back to normal but she's still angry with me for not letting her go to that dance. I stand firmly by my decision not to let her go. But was I the jerk? You're the jerk. I stopped reading at Teach Her a Lesson. It's a school dance. She's not having privileges restricted for poor behavior. So this is just about your ego and need for control, which is a stupid thing to subject a kid to. You're really claiming your kid and her mother are scheming to strong arm you into a school event that most parents are excited to take pictures for? Getting all dressed up for a first formal high school dance? You're the jerk. It's standard high school stuff and your daughter will never forget this. It isn't some wild after party, it's literally her homecoming dance. I cannot even imagine my father acting this way towards me. She will always remember dad not letting her go to her freshman homecoming for such a petty reason. Yes, it's important to teach your kids to ask permission and not expect, but she didn't even ask you to pay for anything or expect anything from you at all. You blew this way out of proportion. You're the jerk. I'm a dad of teenagers too, including daughters. You need to hear this. Kids her age are starting to learn to be independent. She's exercising her independence in a safe manner by going to a school sanctioned event. And for some weird reason, you don't want her to? Why on earth should she have to ask you to go to homecoming? Please apologize to her for interfering with her plans. Please tell her you realize you were wrong. There was no reason for you to stop her from going. Tell her that like all parents, you're doing your best and sometimes you make mistakes. And this was one of those times. Tell her you're going to try to do better to let her make her own decisions without having to run everything by you. Not the jerk. Going against the grain here, but most of these people bashing on you are not slash will not ever make good parents. They were not raised to be respectful and ask permission before making plans and they will not teach their spawn to either. That's why they're wasting their time here on Reddit instead of doing important things in life. Well, what are you doing? Gotta go. Got an important Zoom meeting soon. God bless you, and I hope you can save your daughter before it's too late. Well, what do you think? Is dad a jerk for not letting her go to homecoming or not? Please let us know. I'm still in awe about that guy talking about the Zoom meeting. Bruh. That time a customer tried to return things, we never even sold to her. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was the assistant to the retail manager of a swimming pool store. We sold, as you might guess, swimming pools and swimming pool supplies. Anyone that has the misfortune of owning a pool or working in the industry knows that pool chemicals are a big part of pool maintenance and sales, and every shop has its own line of products, and they are always better than every other shop's line of products, despite it really all being the same stuff. One day, I was manning the store on closing shift. It was towards the end of the season and things had slowed down that evening. A few minutes before closing time, I get a customer. Oh, good, you're still open. I internally roll my eyes. We all know that line. It's five minutes before quitting time, but I put on my best customer service smile. Me, how can I help you? Customer, and I use the term loosely. I'd like to return these chemicals. Me, hmm, okay. It's actually store policy that we cannot accept returns on chemicals. This was true. There were signs up everywhere and it was written on receipts as well. 
Customers in the past would purchase chemicals, use them, then return them after filling them with water or other substitute materials. So we had stopped accepting returns years and years ago. Customer. Oh, well, can you make an exception? My pool just went down and I don't have any use for them now. I'm just trying to recoup my losses. Me, feeling sorry for her like the sucker I was. Okay, uh, do you have your receipt? Customer. No. Me. Well, let me see what you have. She plops several canisters of various pool chemicals on the table. Me. These are all open and half used, and they aren't my brand of chemicals. You didn't even buy them from me. Can you give me anything for them? Me. Fighting the urge to get rude. Sorry, can't help you. This must have been 10 years ago. I've moved on to a different industry and thankfully blocked out many of the painful memories of that awful job. But I'll never forget the audacity of that customer trying to return half-used chemicals that she didn't even buy from me. Reply. Back in my teens, I worked for a place that sold and installed above-ground pools. Absolute worst disasters waiting to happen a homeowner could put upon themselves of their own volition. We received a call from homeowner who had the largest pool we sold at the time. This was mid-1980s, which was an 18 by 22 above ground. He said his pool collapsed. Naturally, the owner of the business sent us out there in a panic. The homeowner's street was on a hill with them being it near the top. The freshly shocked pool water, all 6,000 gallons of it, had washed across four yards, one of which had several thousands of dollars in landscaping. It killed a lot of plants and washed away several smaller structures. The homeowner sued us for shoddy installation, but it turned out the idiot had hit the pool with his lawn tractor. Apparently, his neighbors didn't like the guy too much, and two of them signed statements to our lawyer and the guy's homeowner's insurance that he was the cause of the collapse. There are idiots, there are super idiots, then there are above-ground pool owners. Am I the jerk for telling my husband that he embarrassed himself? For context, I was raised by my single father. He raised me to be totally self-serving, where I learned not only to cook, clean, etc., but to be my own handyman. This has led me to being very independent, especially around my house. My husband, on the other hand, was raised to expect to have everything done for him and never really learn any self-sustaining skills, but also raised to believe that the man is never wrong. Fast forward to last week, I needed to buy a new line trimmer as my old faithful finally gave up on life. I was busy with the kids and my husband said he would go pick it up for me. I told him which one I wanted and what brand all my power tools are. He said he understood, but when he came back, he had purchased one from a different brand. When I asked about it, he said he thought it was better and it was also cheaper than the one I wanted. This annoyed me, but I thought whatever. He tried, move on. It wasn't until I looked at it, I realized he hadn't bought the battery pack to go with it. When I asked, he told me I could just use the batteries for my other tools. I tried to explain to him that this wasn't possible and why, but he didn't want to hear it. A few moments later, he said, Okay, my brother is coming over and we can go back to the hardware store. I thought we would either be exchanging it or buying the battery pack, but I was so wrong. When we got there, he walked straight up to the tool shack and asked the tool specialist to explain to me how my Ryobi's battery would work perfectly fine in my new Makita line trimmer. Well, let's just say that this didn't go well. The tool guy sided with me and explained when you committed to a tool brand, you stay with it due to a few aspects about the batteries. He was embarrassed but quickly did the exchange when finding out the battery and charger pack cost more than the line trimmer itself. When we got home, it started. He was yelling at me about how I embarrassed him, how I'm constantly emasculating him, and how I should be a good wife and just stick to doing things appropriate. Well, this got to me and I snapped. I replied with, The only person that's emasculating you is yourself. It's not my fault you never learned to be what you call a man, and I walked off. It's been a week now, and he only speaks to me through the kids. It's got me thinking, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You hit the nail on the head. He's the one putting expectations on himself. There's a bigger issue here though I find disturbing. He refused to listen to you and express his controlling views. He tried to purposefully humiliate you in public and is mad at you when it backfired and is now punishing you and putting your kids in the middle of it by only communicating through them. Is this the modeling you want your kids to see? 
How you want your kids to treat or be treated by their spouses later? A loving, supportive spouse would never ambush another with public humiliation. This is some twisted stuff. Maybe it's time to ask yourself how your dad would want you to be treated and how he'd want you to respond to this. Not the jerk. Dude did it to himself, got embarrassed, and then tried to take it out on you. Except you weren't having it either. I'd be more concerned about him taking his frustrations out on you, but you shut him down so perfectly, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Stick to your guns. Find a nice high horse to sit on, maybe even an ivory tower to look down from. You are in the right here. Boss helps mean employee accidentally fire herself. This isn't my personal story, but it happened to a friend at his company and I thought it was hilarious. The main characters are my friend, Patrick, male, then 26, Allie, female, then 29, and Boss, man who was older. Patrick and Allie worked at the same company and the same division under Boss. Allie was mean to all the employees in the division, but especially to Patrick because he was the newcomer and he was talented and he didn't suck up to her. Her bullying tactics included, but were not limited to, taking credit for other people's ideas, convincing Patrick that the others in the division didn't like him, attempting to ruin the career of anyone who didn't suck up to her by preventing them from getting assigned to cool new projects, and last and worse, trying to get Patrick fired, which she almost succeeded in doing. She was so horrible to Patrick that his mental health suffered a decline. Everyone was vaguely aware of her behavior but she hid the worst parts of it, so it was never quite obvious or bad enough to get her fired. Plus, she was also popular with the company's clients, who didn't know, and she was a favorite of one of the top people at the company. Allie seemed untouchable until several months after the Patrick almost gets fired incident, when the company started having a conversation about moving some of their employees to contract positions. Becoming a contractor would have its pros and cons. Contractors would pay for their own health insurance and would have no job security, being hired for individual contracts rather than a permanent employment position. But they would also be allowed to work for other companies. It was a great move for someone who was well known and wanted more visibility and options, but a lousy move for someone lower on the totem pole. Ellie, who was somewhat of a narcissist who believed she was destined for greatness, waltzed into Boss's office and told him she wanted to switch to a contractor position. She believed the company couldn't get by without her and would continue hiring her while she also got to work for other companies and gain fame and visibility within the industry. Boss was all smiles and pretended to be supportive of her. This is a great career move. Think of all the options you'll have. As soon as the paperwork was signed, he never hired her for a single contract and her future with the company, the best one in the city for this particular industry, was ruined. Allie eventually found employment elsewhere but it wasn't as good as the position she had left. Patrick found out the second part of the story years later. He was under the impression, because of what Allie had said and how people avoided him because they knew Allie didn't like him, that no one was on his side and that his coworkers and boss had actually liked her. They hadn't. Turns out, boss felt his hands were tied because she was a favorite of one of the top people at the company, but as soon as she gave him an out that allowed him to never have to work with her again, he took it. Would I be the jerk if I forced the family's house sale? I'm 20, male. My grandma passed four months ago. She was the sole owner of the house previously owned by her husband slash my grandpa, who himself inherited it from his grandpa. Why I tell you this? So that you understand that I'm speaking about a giant, two full blocks, colonial villa. Not only is this place extremely expensive, but it was also where three or four generations of my family grew up. All my uncles and aunts, six in total, and my mother were raised in there, and two of them are currently living in there with their families. Grandma had a very basic will, in which the house was left to my sons and daughters. Now, here comes the tricky part. I lost my mom six years ago to cancer. In my country, if an heir has passed, but they themselves have descendants, the inheritance goes to them. In other words, I replace my mom in my grandma's will, meaning I'm one of the seven inheritors of the house. Thing is, I don't want the house. I need the money. If I had it, I could actually study abroad and live in my dream country, Australia if someone is wondering. Now, because I want the inheritance and money, this means there are only two options. The house is sold and all seven of us receive cash or the other inheritors buy my part. My aunts and uncles want to keep the house and the family, but while they are in a good economical place, there's no way for them to pay me my part. So they have resorted to emotional attacks 
How could I do this to the family? That I'm a monster for valuing money over legacy? That they will completely cut me off if I go through it, etc. Honestly, I get it. The house has great emotional value. But my way of thinking is that with so many owners, and they themselves having kids, it will be inevitably sold at some point in the future. It will also begin to drain our pockets as it deteriorates with time. It has already needed its good share of renovations. On the other hand, they are middle-aged adults. They already have most of their lives set, so they have the privilege, not sure if this is the right word, to have thousands of dollars resting in bricks and memories. Not my case. What do you guys think? Reply. It doesn't matter what the internet tells you. If you force this sale, your family will never forget and probably never forgive. So balance that against the money. That said, you're the jerk in my opinion. You want your dream at the expense of other people's memories and happiness. Not the jerk. I think if you talk to an estate lawyer, you should be able to work something out where they take out a loan for your one-seventh and you get paid. Everyone sucks here. While it's not okay for them to resort to emotional attacks, I don't think it's okay for you to force the sale of the house when there are six other inheritors who value it immensely. Edit. I'm assuming the OP has not put the idea of them getting a loan on the table with the family and has decided to jump to selling the entire house. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or are the relatives? Please let us know. He do be kind of cold for that though, bruh. But if the house is that important to them, they need to pay him off so he can be done with it. $132.21 total for a four-night stay? Yeah, right. Our hotel is within 10 miles of a Ford assembly plant, and we get a lot of guests staying with us that are affiliated with Ford, either as a direct employee or a subcontractor coming in to do work at the plant. The Ford rate is $117 plus tax, which is a substantial savings off of our rack rate. So anyway, I had a guy check in Friday night that had a reservation for four nights with the Ford rate. We progress through the check-in process and when we get to the point where he needs to insert his card into the card reader, yes, we require guests at check-in to insert their card into the card reader. GM says it's to help cut down on fraud. He freaks out over the amount of his stay, plus incidental hold, showing on the screen. He wants to know why it's so much when he was told the rate was 117 plus tax for his stay. I told him the total showing was for 117 plus tax per night plus the incidental hold. He starts screaming at me, saying he was told when he made the reservation that the total would be just 132 for my whole stay. I told him he must have misunderstood the reservation agent, because do you really think you'd get a room here for four nights for just 132 bucks? He says yes, and goes on to say that if he knew he was going to have to pay over $500, he would have made a reservation somewhere else. At this point, I was getting tired of him yelling at me. So I tell him that if he would prefer to stay somewhere else, I could cancel the check-in process and cancel his reservation. Or he can have his card authorized for the full amount and be on his way to his room. He threatened to call corporate and have me fired. I told him to have at it as I wasn't in the wrong. After steaming and stewing for a few more minutes, he finally decides he wants to stay and we finish the check-in process. As he walks away from the front desk, he says that he will be speaking with my manager in the morning. I tell him that the GM won't be in until Monday morning. This was Friday night and approximately 11.15 p.m., but our AGM would be in at 9 a.m. Saturday morning. He says he'll wait to talk to the big boss on Monday. As an added bonus, he calls down about 30 minutes later, saying that when he made his reservation, he requested a smoking room, but didn't see an ashtray in his room. I tell him that all of our rooms are non-smoking, and if he wanted to smoke, he would need to go outside to do so. I got treated to yet another verbal assault, so I just hung up on him. Thankfully, I didn't have any more interactions with him for the rest of the night, and hopefully I won't for the remainder of his stay. Remind me again why I do this job. Am I the jerk? I told my wife to stop acting like she's too good for a local diner. Today was my younger daughter's birthday, so we asked her where she wanted to go for dinner at. She said that she wanted to go to Denny's, so that's where we went. Our daughters ordered burgers and waffles. I ordered steak and my wife took a salad. She kept complaining about the food, saying it wasn't good. I tasted some of her salad and it tasted fine. I asked her what the problem was and she said the diner wasn't good enough and that it isn't as good as the restaurants we usually go to. She likes to go to high-end restaurants. I took her aside and told her to stop acting like she's too good for a local diner 
and to suck it up for our younger daughter's happiness at least. She got mad and said that I'm being rude to her and that this restaurant was really cheap and not good enough. So I gave her the car keys and told her to drive herself home and get dinner for herself from a high-end restaurant of her choice and that I'd get a cab for myself and the kids. She stormed out of the restaurant. When the kids asked me where mommy went, I told them that Nana called her so she had to go, but she'd make it up to them with ice cream. We had dinner, went to a movie, and took a cab home. When we reached home, I put them to bed because my wife hadn't returned yet. I called her and she said she'll be at her mom's place for the night. I think maybe I was too harsh on her. Am I the jerk? Edit. My daughters like the fast food joints a lot because they rarely get a chance to go there. My wife hates eating there, so she never takes them. I take them for a quick meal after school sometimes, but that's the only time they go there. They probably feel bad looking at their friends who get to go to such places all the time. Not the jerk. My mom did something similar to me when I got to choose a restaurant for my birthday dinner as a little kid, and I still remember how awful it was as a full-grown adult. If you're going to do a birthday event, the event is about giving the birthday kid a treat. If a parent is going to complain and sulk and otherwise ruin the meal, then there's no point in having the meal at all. You weren't harsh, you were direct, and you were 100% correct. If your wife can't put her kids' wants first for one meal a year, then she just shouldn't come to the birthday dinner. Not the jerk. Your wife was putting her snobbery above her kids' happiness while you had your priorities in the right place. You did a great job of putting your kids' needs first and made sure your wife didn't get to ruin your daughter's birthday. No, Denny's isn't fancy. It isn't fancy at all. They've never been accused of having great food, but their food isn't terrible either. It's a perfectly fine place to get a meal and it's what her daughter wanted for her day. Your wife not being willing to sit through one basic, unexciting meal for her daughter's birthday is far worse than the quality of the food she was snubbing. Keep putting your kids first and showing them what it looks like to have your priorities in the right places. Karen sues me for child support knowing that I'm not the father. I, 27 male, used to live in a crappy apartment building. I had a neighbor right next to me called Sarah, approximately 24 female, who had a six-year-old son, Mark. I had lived there for three years and moved out about two months ago. My grandfather passed away and left most of his money and possessions to me and my sisters. It wasn't much after taxes, but I was able to use it as a deposit on an apartment. Sarah and her son moved in about four to five months after I did, and although she didn't talk about it, I got the feeling that her ex hadn't been the greatest. Police would come around occasionally to check if she was okay. The kid was scared stiff of loud noises and yelling, etc. I work from home, data analyst, so I was around a lot. Mark used to go to a preschool while she worked and then after he started school, he was supposed to go to an after school thing. Sarah works 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. as a nurse aide. Problem is that back in March of last year, his after school thing closed and then a couple months later, his school shifted all their learning online while his mom only got busier because of what was going on. I kept seeing him playing outside by the road or hanging off the balcony and was a bit worried for his safety, so I started offering him hot chocolate and keeping an eye on him. About a week later, Sarah came by and offered me $20. She was very apologetic and explained that her parents disowned her and she couldn't afford a full-time nanny for him but also couldn't afford to quit her job to keep an eye on him, which was basically her only other option. My older sister is a nurse, and I'd seen her looking shattered and with bruises on her face from her masks, so I felt really bad for them and offered to keep an eye on Mark while she worked, since I was at home anyway, and he's a cool kid. Long story short, I told Sarah in October I was moving out, and she was distraught about what she'd do with Mark. Schools and daycare still haven't reopened here yet. I offered for her to drop him off at my new place while she was working as a temporary solution during lockdown. This had been working for the past couple of months until I received a letter from a lawyer basically informing me that Sarah was filing for child support against me as I had taken a paternal figure in Mark's life. I immediately called Sarah and told her to come get Mark. We had a massive fight because basically she thinks I can afford it so why shouldn't I pay it? After she picked him up, I blocked her number and contacted a lawyer who told me that I would probably be fine as I'm not his dad and I never offered to take care of him in any financial way. Sarah has been in touch with my sisters who think that I'm doing the right thing by not paying but I'm being a jerk by refusing to look after Mark anymore. I feel like crap since he's probably being stuck in those crappy apartment blocks again but I also don't want to risk a court case. 
Am I the jerk for refusing to look after him while she works? Tiny update. Thank you all for your lovely messages. I can't see some of them because of a Reddit error that keeps popping up, but I'm trying to read all of them. I've said this a few times in the comments, but we'll put it here too. After what has happened, I have contacted the authorities. I haven't had an update from them, but I will post here if I hear anything. Karen thinks my unborn baby belongs to her because she is a godly married woman. This evening, I was at a different church from the one I usually attend. I had work a longer shift than usual, so I couldn't make it to mine on time. I'm familiar with this group of believers as I went to their church's school in high school. I go in, find a seat, and settle in. After the service is over, I'm walking around, talking to people who I haven't seen in a while. They're extending congratulations and asking about my pregnancy, which when done respectfully is fine. However, it was not to last. Up walks Sister Karen. Oh my, Tannerland, when did you get married? I didn't get an invite. She wouldn't get an invite regardless. No, Sister Karen, I didn't find the one just yet. I had artificial insemination done to bring my little love to be. Cue a face longer than two horses combined. Wow, Tannerland, I didn't think you would be so stupid and not think about how selfish you are. There are so many folks that are both married and actually serve the church. You could have offered your womb to these godly folks so that they could raise the child in church and in a complete home. I was in so much shock, I could not form words. I and Brother Karen will be happy to raise that child. She's pointing at my pregnant stomach. In a complete home. We cannot have any more, so this is a great blessing to our family. I said, Haha, you got any more jokes? This is my baby. If you come near me or my kid or any of the kids that I have, you will be getting changed along an RO. Then I just went to continue talking to other people. On my way back to my car, she tried to pray over me to give my baby to her and her husband, the innocent and unfortunate baby in my womb. She is nuts. She's always been a nutter, but today, just the entire cake along with the plate it was sitting on. Some people. I understand some Redditors have a different opinion about church and faith than I do, which is your business, but please scroll on if you only want to say negative things about the believers. Thank you. Am I the jerk for refusing to host Thanksgiving for over 20 people for the fourth year in a row? So my fiancé has a rather large family. Parents, two brothers with significant others, numerous adult nieces and nephews and their partners, and there's usually always some distant aunt, uncle, or cousins that tag along. I have two family members that join holidays. This year, neither will be able to attend. Last year, one was present. So for the past four years, I've been single-handedly cooking from scratch and hosting for both Thanksgiving and Christmas. So essentially, I've been cooking dinner for 20 people or so while my partner babysits a brisket in the smoker. There's a lot of logistics behind cooking for a large crowd. I start prepping the night before, cook all morning and afternoon, and by the time everything is done, I'm too exhausted to enjoy the food I cooked and eat. Last year, I requested that everyone attending bring one side dish or dessert. No one brought anything. I had a feeling that's what it was going to be as no one mentioned what they're bringing, so I prepared for it anyway. Just to also mention, I've never been thanked for hosting or cooking, literally by no one. All leftovers get picked over and taken home. Last year, I also had to cook the following day because there was nothing left to eat except some baked rye that my mother-in-law turned her nose up to and I wanted to enjoy leftovers at least. This year, I told my partner that I have no intention of cooking. If he wanted a host, he can cater. His reaction was, But that's our tradition. Can't you at least make some box stuffing or something? And, Everyone is planning on coming. My reaction was, Nope, that's your tradition. I will not make box stuffing. And, If they're planning on coming, you better put that catering order in. He has not spoken to me since. I also had to explain, and I shouldn't have to, that I haven't been feeling well. I finished an 8 month course of a pretty rough medication that dries out all the joints in your body. I've been achy and miserable and I feel stiff when I overwork myself. Am I the jerk for not wanting to entertain 20 plus people twice a year every year? I have decided to possibly sit out Thanksgiving completely, buy a pre-made single serving Thanksgiving dinner at the local grocery store that just needs to be popped in the oven for a while and going to watch that new Lady Gaga movie. Edit. 
Guys, my partner found this post and sent me the link. Now apparently we're canceling everything because I'm venting to strangers on the internet. I guess he didn't like what he read. Oops. Not the jerk. So his Thanksgiving tradition is, we pick one woman who's been brought into the family, we tell her that her partner is hosting Thanksgiving, then we load her with all of the responsibility for hosting and catering. We don't help or thank her. Her partner isn't allowed to do anything apart from barbecue duties. But what can you do? It's tradition. Yeah, forget that. If it's so important to your fiancé, he can host and cook. If he's that incapable, then he needs to stop volunteering. Go a step further. Rent a hotel room for a week or stay with a friend. Make sure that if he goes through with hosting, he's not only left with full responsibility for catering and hosting, he also has to clean up by himself. Edit. OP, I just saw your edit about your fiancé seeing this post. I encourage you to follow your plans regardless. Thanksgiving is going to be nasty if you don't. Please don't subject yourself to any more of that. P.S. OP's fiancé, you really suck so far at this whole being a fiancé thing. Improve and fast. Do something nice and apologize instead of complaining that she felt so alone she had to talk to a bunch of strangers to realize that she wasn't the jerk. You did that. You did her over. Stop it. Not the jerk. I'm not understanding why they did not bring anything when you asked. He probably loves to feel like big man on campus and hosting. Calmly explain it's just too much for you alone. Then write up a list of what the meal consists of, hand it to him, and let him know that he needs to call everyone and assign a dish to them. I too was cooking for over 20 people several years in a row. I finally made a list of the meal I wanted, these three sides times two, these three desserts times two, appetizers times two, and sent an email to the entire group. Here is a list for Thanksgiving. I made it easy for you all. I will be making the turkey and that's it. Talk amongst yourselves. Decide who is bringing what. If you don't bring it, we will not have it. Do not ignore the times too, because with 20 people, one pan of any of the above will not be enough for all. I love you all, but again, I will not be providing anything more than the turkey as this year. I would like to enjoy the meal with you all versus serving everyone all day. My mother-in-law apologized for not realizing others were not chipping in. She always brought a ham and whipped everyone into shape, including the adult nephews and nieces. It's worked out wonderfully since then. Or if hubby is set on hosting, you were right to tell him to call for catering. Besides restaurants, several grocery stores offer full meal catering for the holidays, but he is probably pushing a deadline by now. Good luck. My neighbor Margaret's revenge against her complete monster of a daughter. This was an ongoing story about my friend and neighbor Margaret over the course of five years that's escalated this past May. Margaret is this sweet late 70s woman who lives on my street. My street is sparsely populated, her house is roughly 800 meters from mine, and there's a total of five houses on my rural street, so lots of space. I met Margaret when I first built my house. She was the first and only person to come say hello. She brought us a lemon pie. When my husband passed, she was the first person to check on me, and she even made it to the hospital before my mom did. A really great person. After my husband passed, I would visit her a lot. After the first visit, I noticed she never really had any food in her fridge, and I assumed she was not doing well financially. I would go over once or twice a week with prepared meals, with the excuse that I cooked too much. It wasn't untrue, I always cooked too much, but I wanted to make sure she was eating, she's such a sweet woman. Well, during one of my visits, I had dropped off some food and a car pulled up and her daughter walked in. I excused myself and went home. I didn't want to be a third wheel. At this point, I had known Margaret since 2015. I didn't know she had any kids. Well, I went back over when I saw the car leave and I went to make us some tea and open the fridge to grab some milk I dropped off with the meals. Everything was gone, including my plates. Her daughter had taken everything. Well, we got to talking and I found out that her daughter had been handling her finances for several years, paying her bills and taking charge of all of her pension payments. So Margaret worked for General Electric for years and had her CPP. She let me go through her old payments and she had no bills. Her house was paid off and she was supposed to be getting a total of $4,500 a month in pension payments. There's no way that she should have been in any sort of financial hardships her power bill was only $80 a month. I went on to find out her daughter canceled her phone, internet, 
and TV and car insurance so she couldn't even drive. Well, after a bit of talking, she accepted me calling a social worker friend of mine. Well, there was some obvious mistreatment going on here. Within 24 hours, we had her daughter locked out of her bank account, her pension checks direct deposited, everything, and I made up my mind to keep a close eye on her house in case her daughter came back. Not even a week later, I see that car roll up to Margaret's house, so I decide to go for a walk to check in on Margaret. Right at the top of her driveway, I can see into her front window, and what I saw made me take out my phone and call the police and start recording. That crazy jerk was attacking her. Before you judge me why I didn't rush in to stop it, well, I'm what you'd call super tiny. I'm only 4 foot 8 inches and 80 pounds. To be truthful, it's not hard to toss me around like a rag doll. For my safety, it was better for me to wait for the police. Well, her daughter was arrested and Margaret ended up staying with me and my family from mid-May to the end of September. Now the whole story gets super long, so I'm going to do a quick rundown of what happened. Her daughter was arrested and the RCMP got involved. Her daughter had been stealing money off Margaret for at least five years. Her daughter had taken over $250,000 from her bank and almost the entirety of her pension payments over $50,000 a year. It gets better. Her daughter's son was involved with it and after investigations, he was arrested and charged. Well, everything finished up in October. Both of them got over two years in prison and a no contact order. Margaret was able to recover $200,000 and is getting her pension payments and is much happier. But that's not where the real revenge is. Margaret's house is worth over $2 million. Those two jerks are going to get out of prison with nothing. But Margaret met with an estate lawyer and she wanted to write me into her will. And I said, no, no, no. I have more than enough to live comfortably for the rest of time. Well, she wrote her will to give everything to a charity called Covenant House. It's a shelter for women. Oh yeah, she did leave her daughter and grandsons in the will. They both get a whopping one cent. Margaret sent a copy of it to her daughter and her daughter's kid in jail, attached to a Christmas card and a letter saying Merry Christmas. I took her to the post office today to mail it. So yeah, that's the story of Margaret's revenge. Those two jerks are sitting in jail, will come out to nothing and will get absolutely nothing from their mother's estate. Honestly, Margaret is one of the sweetest women I have ever met. My mom moved to a place on my street and they are like best friends. Am I the jerk for not calling out my son for treating my daughter badly? I have two kids, a son, Ben, who's 44, and a daughter, Emma, who's 42. Their father and I divorced when they were young. He wasn't a good husband, but he isn't a bad man. He is wealthy. He didn't bond with Emma and he always favored Ben. It became overt as they grew up. Ben was easier than Emma and did well in school and sports. Emma, although smart, wasn't interested in school and was rebellious as a teenager. Their father spoiled Ben and, if I'm honest, he wasn't nice to Emma. This upset her and she would cry, feeling unfairly treated. I felt bad, but I couldn't do anything about it, so felt it better to pretend it wasn't happening and hope it got better. It didn't. He wanted nothing to do with her, although there wasn't a reason why. Emma struggled to cope with this and I think expected me to stand up for her, but I hate confrontation and her father never listens to me anyway. I preferred not to discuss it with Emma and focus on other things, but she said I didn't allow her to be upset and didn't validate her. I didn't want to potentially cause a bigger rift and cause Ben to side with his father. Ben, on the other hand, was lavished with anything he wanted. Money, cars, he was expected to be successful like his father. As adults, the relationship between Ben and Emma fizzled out, which was sad, but I couldn't do anything about it. Despite being given a large amount of wealth and more opportunities than most, Ben hasn't become successful and he is quite resentful about it. His father stopped giving him money a few years ago and he partially blames me because I told his father that he had given him too much. Despite being an easy kid, Ben has grown up to be a rather difficult, he has a temper and is very sensitive about his lack of career success, so we aren't allowed to talk about it. Emma is a stay-at-home mom. She's a good mom and her children's father earns a lot of money. Her father was regretful, so he reconnected with her. They have a relationship that's quite superficial, but I think it healed the wound a bit for Emma, so she reached out to Ben. They got along well for a couple of years, but Ben stopped speaking to Emma. Emma was upset 
and thinks it's because Ben doesn't like their father's interest in her. Ben hasn't given her an explanation, but he told me a silly reason that doesn't make sense. I told Emma, I think Ben has behaved very badly. She asked me if I told him that. I said no, and she shouted at me that I've never stuck up for her or protected her, and if I can't do it this one time, she doesn't want a relationship with me. That I enable this behavior at her expense, and she's sick and tired of it. The thing is, Emma has three kids, and Ben has one kid. Emma will still allow me to have a good relationship with her kids, but Ben has made it difficult for me to see his kid in the past when he is angry, so I'm afraid he will do that again and stop speaking to me. I also don't want to be forced to be in the middle of them, so I won't do it. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk for being a total failure as a mother to your daughter. You allowed this behavior by not sticking up for her. So what if you hate confrontation? Does that give you a right to emotionally abandon her? You are terrible, and if I were her, I'd never speak to you again, since you just want to suck up to your son for the sake of being grandma. I hope Emma cuts you all out of her life. You've all failed her. You're the jerk. You make excuse after excuse for why you have never protected your daughter from her father, and now you're doing the same about her brother, letting her down all over again. What exactly does your daughter need to do to make you see that her feelings are worthwhile, that she needs someone on her side? You might also want to examine why you always defer to the men in your life at the expense of your daughter's self-esteem. You seem to judge men by how much money they earn, as if this gives them more worth. You even sound more approving of your daughter's well-paid husband than you do of her. Forced to be in the middle of them? For all of the years your daughter has been on earth, you have chosen any side but hers. I reckon it's her turn for love and support. Whether you have the courage to give it to her, at last, is another matter. You've been an emotional coward so far. My heart goes out to that girl. It really does. Am I the jerk for potentially ruining my classmate's career? I, 20 female, am a college student. In my country, a lot of students hunt for internships because it helps them get a better pay package during placements. I've been casually talking with this guy, R, who's also my classmate. He was all friendly at the beginning, but started flirting recently. I never once flirted with him and always just ignored his moves, but last week he asked me out and I said no. In fact, I apologized to him to have him think that somewhere in our conversation I might have led him on. He ghosted me and I didn't think much of it. But two days later, he texted me again, asking me out. I told him that I already said no, to which he replied. He gave me time to think it over and that I should be grateful for it. Not gonna lie, I got upset and told him to buzz off. And he got upset and called me all the names under the moon and just shamed me for it. I blocked him, but he made his friends start messing with me too. I got super frustrated and called him out on my story along with attaching the snapshot of our chats. Around 300 people saw, and one among them is placement mentor, fourth year student. I didn't think much of it because after the story, I blocked them all and went ahead with my day. The placement head saw this kind of behavior as unacceptable and appalling, so he reported this to our department head. Apparently, in my college, this kind of behavior is labeled as harassment and punishment can lead to suspension. The department head and placement mentor called me to the DH's office to get my statement and I did. I showed them everything. Well, he got suspended for three months for his behavior. He was about to get a very good internship in a government company, but since he got suspended, that internship is also gone. Our professor P loves him and he called me to his office to go and make another statement to DH saying that I forgive him, and there's also wrong on my part. Our DH called me, R, his parents, and two professors, P and Q. DH asked me if I'm willing to forgive him. This will get him off the suspension. Somewhere inside of me, I wanted to see him suffer, so I told him no. I was harassed, and I want him punished. His mother berated me in front of everyone, saying that I'm the one who led him on, and I'm doing this purposefully because he's my competitor, and her son is the victim here. DH didn't listen to her and gave R his rightful punishment. Well, at least according to me. Well, now our internship started and few of my friends said I took it too far. He just called me names while texting and I got him suspended for that. Some of my other classmates called me a bully and a jerk for ruining his bright future and Professor P called me outside the class today and told me that he's extremely disappointed in me and it's because of people like me, potential careers are ruined. 
This actually made me cry, and I'm rethinking whether what I did was actually extreme. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Well done to your mentor and DH for stamping out this behavior. You should raise a complaint against Professor P whose behavior is appalling. It wasn't you that affected R's career, it was R with his harassing behavior. But I can see you might not want to make this last any longer than it already has. OP. I do want to complain about this professor, but I'm honestly very scared now. I'm doing my internship and I'm scared he might try to do something. He's one among the major professors in our department and his subject is mandatory. Unfortunately, I don't have many friends to support me either. Am I the jerk for telling my sister she's adopted? I, male 22, have a sister, female 14, Cassie. Our parents adopted Cassie when I was 8 and she was 5 months old. They wanted to have a second kid, but mom wasn't able to get pregnant again. Of course, at the beginning, I wasn't very fond of having a younger sibling. But as for now, I love her deeply, and despite our age difference, I've got good contact with her, or at least I assume so. She's actually pretty funny to hang out with. We never really talked about her being adopted, and I never heard my parents talking about that with her. However, since she's 14 already, I assume they talked to her about the issue, especially since Cassie doesn't resemble neither me nor my parents. She has a tad similar hair color to mom's, but that's it. To be honest, I never really thought about it. Anyway, a few weeks ago, my sister came to me and straightforward said, I'm adopted, right? I was dumbstruck, as I was sure she knew it already. However, I asked her, why does she think so? She explained to me that she was thinking about that for some time, mainly because of how she looks different than the rest of the family, and how she got almost sure after biology class when they talked about genetics, and she realized she has attached earlobes while the rest of us don't. As I said, she's a smart one. So I told her the truth. I also told her that it doesn't change anything and she'll always be my little sister, as well as our parents' daughter. And actually, she was like, Duh, I don't doubt it. I just wanted to know if I'm right about the adoption. I wasn't sure if I did the right thing, but she's 14 already, and she was the one asking, so it didn't feel right to lie to her. Anyway, when our dad came back home, she simply told him she knows the truth. She also mentioned she knows from me, and asked why didn't they tell her. In my opinion, she didn't seem angry or sad and asked rather out of curiosity. Dad was pretty cool about the whole ordeal, told her they wanted to tell her when she turns 18. In our country, that's when you reach adulthood. She seemingly accepted it and that was it. Our mom, however, went fully hysterical upon learning that Cassie knows everything. She started crying, hyperventilating, and then shouting at me that I had no right to tell this to my sister. That I just had to ruin everything for her and that I have no saying in the matter as I'm not Cassie's parents. We tried to explain to her I wasn't even the one bringing up the topic, but she didn't listen. Now our mom doesn't talk to me, as well as part of her side of the family. They say I'm the jerk for violating our parents' rights by telling Cassie the truth. By the way, from what I gathered, it seems like mom didn't want to tell Cassie about the adoption at all, and telling her on her 18th birthday was dad's idea. Am I the jerk for simply answering my sister's question about adoption? Not the jerk. You aren't required to maintain your parents' lie. The advice of professionals is a person should never remember learning they are adopted. They should be told before they are capable to understand and continue to be told in age-appropriate and loving ways as they get older. So it's just as much a part of the adoptee's story that they are adopted as it's part of your story that your mother birthed you. Your parents took the gamble of Cassie figuring out an openly kept secret before they were ready to tell her. That's on them. Managers aren't allowed to tell me to use their parking space when they're off? Alright then. So this happened a good six years ago now. I was just starting my IT career, so I was a basic level 1 desktop engineer for a large financial company. My team consisted of me, a level 2 engineer, and three managers. One for data, one for people, and one overall manager. Parking in town was either expensive or impossible, and while management and supervisors got parking spaces in the huge multi-story next to the office, other staff members didn't get one and either had to pay the very expensive parking fees or park far away and walk. Being on a low entry-level salary, I opted to walk the 30 minutes into town and often got sick due to bad weather. The level 2 guy lived a 5-minute walk from the office and didn't own a car. When any of the managers were off, they offered their parking space to me so that I wouldn't have to walk, 
which was very nice of them and greatly appreciated as it was saving me money too. One day, I got called into HR because somebody saw me coming out of the multi-story and got jealous and asked why I get a space and they don't. This HR manager was incredibly condescending and talked to me like I was a literal kid with lines like, back when I was your age, I thought the world owed me everything too, which is absolutely not my attitude, but sure, go off like you know me. She said it wasn't fair on the level two guy because he might want the space too. She wouldn't listen when I said he didn't drive and even said to me he didn't want it after I asked if he was okay with me using the space. At the end of the day, I went into the management office and we were chatting about the day as we usually did and I told them about the HR meeting and said they weren't allowed to let me use their space anymore. The data manager then had a genius malicious compliance suggestion. She was a very selfless soul who sacrificed much of her time to help other people and this situation rubbed her the wrong way and she wanted to do something out of spite. She said that whenever one of them were on holiday, they'd just tell me that their parking space will be empty for the duration. Not specifically that I can use it, which is what we were told not to do from HR. So the next time they were on holiday, I parked in their space, and after a few days, somebody else got jealous and tattled to HR again. I was dragged into a meeting and asked why I was still using their space. I said that I just took a chance on an empty space I found in the multi-story. They were rented, not pay and display. She went and asked the data manager when she was back in if she said I could use the space, to which she said, no, I just said goodbye before I went on holiday for two weeks. HR then told her I was in her space in her absence and asked her if she wanted to raise a complaint against me. She said, no thanks, I wasn't using it anyway. Their hands were tied and there was nothing they could do to prevent me from using the spaces as they're allocated privately to the individuals for use even outside of office hours and only reclaimed when they leave. Am I the jerk for training her kids like dogs when Karen dumps them on me? My cousin Amy, who's 25 female, has two six-year-old twins and has a nasty habit of dumping them onto relatives to babysit for the entire day without any warning or regard for their time. I, 27 female, have a very strained relationship with her, but because my mom's side of the family demands that we all remain close-knit, so I have no choice to tolerate her. When she initially gave birth to them, she teased me that I'll have to take on babysitting duty from now on. I'm no good with kids, so I remarked to her that if I ever have them, I'll train them, not babysit. She brushed me off. The kids now are very destructive and loud, pulling out stuffing inside furniture, holes inside walls, smashing anything glass and porcelain, screaming louder than a fire alarm, you name it. When it was my first turn to deal with them, I immediately walked them to the store and grabbed the biggest bag of M&Ms I could find and trained them so that every time they followed my orders and behaved, they get one. If they misbehave, I get one. Soon enough, every time the kids were dumped on me, they went with my guidelines and behaved. Whenever I say sit, they sit at the table. When I say stay, they don't leave that spot, etc. Two days ago, there was a party planned with the whole extended family. I know everything going on. Didn't want to, but mom insisted, and I grabbed the M&Ms since the twins were there. Arrived, twins were being so destructive, an entire tray of food was spilled that all the adults had enough and yelled at Amy to control them. She threw out the same excuses of them just being kids, and they'll grow out of it eventually. I shouted the twins' names and shook my M&M bag. They came running over to me, and I popped six pieces into my mouth for their misbehavior. I told them to go clean up the mess or no candy all night. They do so. Halfway through the party, every time something similar came up or they just weren't behaving, I was the one able to calm them down. When Amy saw what I was doing, she got angry and started yelling at me about our kids aren't animals and that I shouldn't be giving them so much candy anyway. I told her that I'm their aunt, not their parent. Why am I the one disciplining them? Isn't that her job? She screamed the same argument at me and since she's their mother, to stop giving them candy. One of the twins overheard and went crazy, dashed straight into the kitchen and started shattering anything they could get their hands on, shouting over and over that he wants candy. His twin joined him soon after. I repeated that she's their mother and just sat in the living room watching it all unfold. In the end, Amy blamed me for them turning out this way. The other relatives she dumped them on, a majority, disagreed 
But when I told a friend about the situation, he told me the training I did can really mess them up mentally later in life. So, am I the jerk? Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.